Okay, members, I'll declare the meeting open, and you're all very welcome today. Um, in the chamber, I have with me Andy Allen on Starleaf. We have Alex Eason, Mark Durkin, Sinead Innes, the Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong, and Karen Mullen. Um, and also in the room with us today, we have our uh, signer, who is Christina St. Clair. So, all very welcome to the meeting today. Um, can I then just start off the meeting with um, declaration of interest? Any members, any declaration of interest they want to bring up at this stage? No, we're okay. We'll wait as we go along. Then I'll go to agenda item one, which is apologies. Can I then ask members, have they any apologies? Fra, please, sir. Thank you, Sinead. That's an apology from Fra. Okay, then we will move on to agenda item two, which is a briefing by the DEF campaign group on the video replay system. Members, there, well, there isn't. Uh, there was a tabled paper, but uh, that this would have been in our packs, but as we have discovered, we didn't receive our tabled papers. So, um, but I'm sure that uh, Jeff and Raymond will be able to give us um, a good overview um, of, of the issues that they're facing. I think we, we have received correspondence in the, uh, previously from them about their issues. Members, you'll also know that for, uh, last week we were unable to source an ISL interpreter for the meeting through the CPD framework. The committee team continued to look wider for an ISL interpreter and contacted the Register of Irish Sign Language Interpreters and the Irish Sign Language Interpreting Service, which is a government interpreting body. None were available for today to travel to Parliament buildings, although on a positive note, we now have a broader set um, of contacts that we can use um, going forward. So it was agreed at last week's meeting that we're going to head today with our briefing. So members content with that and we'll move into the briefing, yes? Okay. Okay, then can I ask um, that the members are taken out of the spotlight and that we bring in Jeff Mowinney and Raymond Abernethy into the spotlight. And as I said, we have Christina here, who is uh, our signer for today. Um, Raymond, can I then ask you to begin your brief? You uh, will be aware, or, uh, Christina will make you aware, certainly, that our tabled papers of which your briefing was in, we were unable to open. So we haven't actually got your briefing in front of us at the moment. Um, so can I ask you then if you could just make some um, opening remarks and brief the committee? Thank you. Okay, so we just need to spotlight Raymond. This is Jeff we have in the spotlight at the moment. Okay, can we, put, up, that'd be really can we have Raymond in the uh, We can see Raymond and Jeff on our spotlight. Can you? Can we have Raymond in the spotlight, please? Okay, yes, this is Raymond now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Raymond's just saying that uh, on behalf of the campaigns team, we would like to thank you for giving us this opportunity today to have this meeting and just to talk about the VRS, the service because it is something that we really do appreciate. As you know, in England and Scotland, when it comes to VRS services, there's an awful lot of access. Northern Ireland just quite aren't there yet. We're a lot further behind, and we do face a lot of restrictions when it comes to accessing services. If we look at the likes of mental health, it really is suffering at the moment. We did send through a list of different issues. They actually came up at open meetings we had with the deaf community. We went out to consultation with the deaf community via Zoom. We had a total of 24 deaf people who fed back their issues, their concerns, but also the positives as well. I just briefly want to address those today and pick up on a few topics which I feel are pertinent. I'm going to maybe mention six, seven things. First of all, VRS for police is a big issue. It's something that we're really battling with. And, and I, I am sorry to bring up negative whenever there is so much positive happening. Deaf people, if they need to contact police, can't. I have one example of somebody who has a family member in Galway. This person had to go to Galway to be able to see what had happened. Now, the problem was with lockdown, with the rules, they weren't sure what to do. They wanted to phone the police to see if they were able to travel down to Galway. It was actually for, for, a, for a bereavement. And just those sorts of things add so much stress and you're already in a stressful environment. This person spent the journey to Galway really frightened that they were going to be stopped by the police. One simple phone call would have really helped to relieve that. Another issue we've had 
is with the likes of CAB, Citizens Advice Bureau. There was a system previous uh, to COVID where there was one CAB advisor was in a deaf organisation in Belfast City Centre. That was the only access to CAB services that deaf people had. You can imagine people who didn't live in Belfast had to travel quite distances to get to that. And now with COVID, there's absolutely no access to any sort of Citizens Advice Bureau. So deaf people need to talk about different things, their benefits, maybe work, things like that, but they can't access the services. A VRS service would really help with that. Another issue I'd like to address is access to work. This has been quite an issue. I know in uh, Northern Ireland there are people who run businesses, deaf business owners, and they're having actually to pay for interpreters themselves because access to work won't give them the full support that they need to be able to run their business effectively. And what that means is that if they want to go out and they want to do work or they want to seek contracts, they have to go out to different businesses and they have to do a lot of work themselves. And they can't do that because they don't have interpreters. They're, so they're really having to do probably double the work that other people could do. If they had access to work that allowed them to make phone calls on top of their access to work budget, that would help so much. An awful lot of smaller businesses can't afford to have their own VRS system, so having access to a VRS system that comes uh, from yourselves would be so much easier. Another issue is translation. Very often deaf people have English as a second language, and you know in business people judge you by your, your English ability. Unfortunately, deaf people cannot use their interpreters to help with this sort of admin work to do some sort of English translation because they don't have enough hours. So if they use interpreters for that, they can't use interpreters for the likes of meetings or work that they need. Mental health, obviously, is something that's difficult for everybody at the moment. But when we look at those deaf people who are very isolated, live, live in rural areas, we have to really think carefully about their mental health. These aren't people who can socialise easily or naturally because they're in such isolated areas. The likes of a VRS service for these people would be wonderful. It would be so, so helpful. It would connect people, connect people, make them more independent, make them live their lives much, much easier, which obviously whenever you're able to take control of your, your life and make calls and be independent, it can really help with mental health. Housing. For example, we all have houses. We all need to repair our houses. Maybe you need to get an electrician in, or maybe you need to get a plumber in. You've had a leak or something. Deaf people can't contact these traders. They can't do it. They have to maybe go out to somebody and say, do you know somebody, and can you help me out? Or, and it's just such a stressful time, whereas if you're not deaf, you lift the phone and you ring somebody, and they come and repair your house. But for deaf people, that's not that easy. I'll give you one example. A friend of mine over in Scotland says that they can access anybody at all with their VRS system. They can phone a plumber, they can phone an electrician. And unfortunately, we're just not there yet, but that's somewhere we really aspire to be. We believe that VRS is such a key service for deaf people to be able to live our lives independently with control, which will have massive ramifications in other areas of life. Now, it's maybe the case that if, say, for example, Somebody, and they, I mean, we, these are examples I have. People who maybe lo lose a loved one, they can't organise a funeral. You know, at these times, whenever just your humanity is so important, to not be able to do a simple thing like manage your loved one's funeral is so difficult. And a lot of people end up relying on children, which is absolutely wrong. Also, obviously, <clears throat> everybody pays their taxes. We all do, don't we? We all have to pay our taxes. But the thing is, if you're not deaf, you can lift the phone and you can access any service you want. If you're deaf, you're limited by the services that have contracts, and that's very difficult. We just want to be citizens who are able to live fully and do everything else that we need to do. You know, sometimes uh, if, if you're hearing and your phone breaks, your life almost ends because you rely on it so much. Well, as deaf people, we feel that too, but we don't have the same access that everybody else has. Now, we do appreciate everything that has been done, and I just hope that has given you a snapshot of some of the issues that we believe are still there. I'd like to now pass over to Jeff, if possible. Can we bring Jeff into the spotlight, please? <clears throat> Jeff, 
Hello there. Hello, everybody. Again, thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. Some of you are maybe wondering, what even is VRS? Essentially, what it is, it's how you make a phone call. We use maybe an app on our phone whereby we click into a, a provider and we have an interpreter on screen. That interpreter then will make the call to that hearing provider, to anybody that we want to call, and they will interpret that phone call. Now, since Belfast City Council decided to take the step and implement a VRS system, there have been a lot more contracts put in place. With coronavirus, obviously, things became very difficult. We appreciate the Department of Communities and Health and Social Care Board for setting up and coming together and funding the VRS. That is probably the first time deaf people have been able to make calls within that area. And it's absolutely fantastic. Unfortunately, though, there's just some areas that need more. For example, people are working from home. They're much more isolated. In the office, you've colleagues around you. You can say to a colleague, could you make this call for me? But people now can't do that because they're so much more isolated. The VRS system is extremely useful for people who are living out in rural areas especially, where interpreters can't always make the journey to their areas. If you look at Northern Ireland and the number of BSL and ISL interpreters we have, and when you map those interpreters, most are living in the east of Northern Ireland, and there are a few around Derry. Now, unfortunately, in the other areas throughout Northern Ireland, there just aren't interpreters there. So if a deaf person has an appointment, an interpreter may have to drive one to two hours to get there and one to two hours back, four hours maybe for a 15-minute GP appointment. It's not feasible. It's not feasible because interpreters need to earn a living too. It's a difficult situation for everybody. But since VRS now has taken off, deaf people in these rural areas are able to have interpreters via, via, via this remote service. Now, again, it comes down to service as well. Sometimes you don't have very good Wi-Fi or, or very good 4G in a certain area. But hopefully that's something that will now start to improve. So there are so many positives to the VRS service that we've had in place up until now, and deaf people are very appreciative of it. There are other areas, I think, and they are mentioned in the report, that need improvement. In Scotland, for example, there's one provider, one provider where you can make any phone call whatsoever. It's not extremely expensive because whenever you look at the number of people using the service per call, it's actually very reasonable. Also, it's making much better use of the pool of interpreters that we have. Rather than interpreters maybe being used up for an entire day for 15 minutes appointment when other people can't get access to that interpreter, VRS means that interpreters can be used much more effectively and can cover many more appointments within the same time frame. Also with ISL, we have very few ISL interpreters and this is a way of utilising the ISL interpreters that we have. I'm not saying that this replaces face-to-face -face interpreting. There's still a place and a very important place for face-to-face -face interpreting. But also VRS can be used in many areas that interpreters have been going out to now where that's not necessary. So it's a very, very effective way of using it. Now, it is the case that it's not a magic wand. VRS won't solve all the problems we have around appointments and access and issues and that. But just as Raymond has said, it can be very helpful. And you know very often, say for example, if your phone breaks or if you get cut off your phone, your life, you feel like you're cut off from society. And deaf people are the same. Our phones bring us into society. It's how we connect, it's how we be. So our phones are so, so important to connect with family and friends. And it is really important. And you're maybe thinking, why not use email? You can always email, can't you? Well, we can, but remember, Deaf people generally have English as a second language, which means they're limited in how they can express themselves via email. Raymond has given some examples where um, he has spoken with his MLA in his area, sent through an email, the MLA received it and didn't understand it. Sent back saying, what is this? And it's, 
and it's the case that that just causes communication breakdowns, and that's because that is over English. And you can imagine if you're working in your second language, you're not going to be as, as fluent as you would be in your first language. And the problem is then, maybe deaf people, it's just a linguistic thing. In order to get our point across, we may use language that isn't as colourful, isn't full of modality which you would normally do, and some people might think it's a bit blunt. And that, that then ruptures relationships. Do you know if you go to another country and you try to try out your Spanish or your French, sometimes you feel miserably and sometimes that's how deaf people can feel too. So, in a snapshot, what we feel is really, really important is that if we could adopt something like the Scottish model for VRS, we have included all that in the, in the report and I hope you can access that. In Scotland, there's one provider and a deaf person only has to contact or use this one app or provider and they can phone anybody that they want to. We would love to see this for both BSL and ISL interpreters here. And we will take any questions if you have any. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff, and thank you, Raymond, uh, for your presentation today. Um, I just have a couple of questions. I know that we have both, uh, we, I've met with both of you on several occasions, and it's good to see you again. And can I just say, I suppose in us trying to set up this meeting, which has taken months, as you both know, um, has taken a lot of work by our, our, by our clerk Janice and our assistant clerk Antoinette in getting this meeting here with us today, just goes to show how difficult and how unfriendly that um, everything is towards the deaf community when, when we can't even hear it in our, our parliament. Um, how, or not that we can't, but we've had great difficulties here in our parliament setting up this briefing in general. Um, so that goes some way um, to just say how difficult uh, that it, it was for us, and it just shows us how, uh, you know, very difficult it is for you. Um, and you've, you've painted a, a, a picture of those difficulties, and I think most definitely we, as an assembly, need to stand up and need to, need to pay attention to this. Um, you had mentioned, uh, I think it was, was it Jeff had mentioned about the Scottish model. Um, can you just give us a, just a little bit more of an explanation, Jeff, of the Scottish model, how it works, how it is paid for, is there any cost to the members of the deaf community when using it? If just give us just a, uh, just a, we've only just received, our table papers are now in our packs, <coughs> and we've only just been able to open them, so we haven't been able to get a good read through them. So if you could just give us a, a, just a brief explanation of that, please, Jeff. Absolutely. Thank you so much. The Scottish model is called Contact Scotland. In Scotland, they only have BSL interpreters, obviously. So really, essentially, what that is, it's almost like a call centre. So there are interpreters in place ready to take calls from deaf people. So a deaf person maybe wants to call their plumber. They've got a leak in the house. They lift up their phone, they open the app, they call through. And I suppose it's like, it's like FaceTime essentially. That's what it looks like to them. Or like Zoom. It's just using a, a video call. They call through to the interpreter, the interpreter appears on screen, they say, hello there, how are you? Listen, I want to phone the plumber, here's their number. The interpreter then dials that number, the interpreter will connect to the plumber, and the, they will say, hello, listen, I have a deaf person on the line, uh, they need to have a leak, and they will have that conversation. The interpreter will just interpret like the interpreter's doing today. It's just like having an interpreter, but through a phone. So if any deaf person wants to phone a hearing person, as we say, they will do so through that interpreter. The Scottish Government decided this from, to fund this from central funds. <coughs> and it just enables deaf people to make the calls that they need to do throughout Scotland to anybody that they need to call. The service... Now, there are some services that are separate. For example, access to work. So those deaf people who are in employment will have a separate fund so that any work-related calls, and that comes from DWP in Scotland, any work-related calls will be paid for by their access to work. They have a budget and they're able to manage that. So that's slightly different. In Northern Ireland, we don't have any separate budgets for access to work, and that's what Raymond brought up. You know, making calls in your job is so, so important. Can you imagine trying to do your job without being able to make phone calls? So in that sense, um, 
that access to work will then be uh, another cost. The problem is here, access to work. When it comes to that, some deaf people are having to pay for their own interpreters, which drives their profit way down. So small businesses, public services, are all covered by the single contract within Contact Scotland. Bigger businesses like banks, they are legally responsible to provide their own VRS service. So Scotland uses one provider to phone any of these bodies that you want to phone. Here in Northern Ireland, if you want to phone the council, there's an app for that. There's another app for the health and social care contract. <coughs> so that's a completely different app. There's also another app if you want to phone the housing executive. So these are all different apps. So deaf people are having to download all these different apps and navigate which services, you know, covers which, which uh, contract. So it's difficult. So in that case, do you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit like saying, phone and Vodafone saying, right, so if I want to phone a bank, I have to use Vodafone. But if I want to phone a doctor, I have to switch to my EE account. So it's just, it's difficult. It's, it's stressful. And deaf people now are maybe phoning one provider and saying, can you phone this person for me? And they're saying, no, you have to download this other app. So it does make it that little bit more complicated to navigate. OK, it certainly does sound a very complicated system that we have here in Northern Ireland, when it could be so much easier and so much more streamlined. Um, I just want to ask a couple of further questions. Just um, how did Scotland come about that VRS system then as well? Uh, was it through a specific bill or was it a, a separate standalone? If you could just, uh, just go into a wee bit of detail around that as well. Jeff? Yes, of course. Okay. When it comes to that and how that came about, the Scottish Parliament had been lobbied by deaf organisations in Scotland. What happened there was this must have been, I'm not exactly sure which department, that's just left me right now, but I know the likes of Tommy McCauley from uh, department, your own department. He works within the language uh, team. He has a connection with that department in Scotland. So Tommy would be able to give you more about the detail around that, uh, because he obviously knows a lot more about that and he knows the ins and outs. How it actually came about, I wouldn't have that level of detail but I do know it started back in 2013. That's when the decision was made. Then 2014, it went out to tender for the contract. Then it began in April 2015 and has been running since very successfully. OK, thank you. And uh, just, uh, I've only just got a couple more questions <coughs> before I bring members in. And by the way, um, I only have Kelly waiting to ask a question, so if any other members want to ask, can they please raise their hand? Um, just maybe then uh, for, uh, for Raymond as well then, um, I know that whenever I've been speaking to you as well, and I think it's in your paper as well, you had made comment about um, the, the, the various charities in the voluntary and community sector that we have here in Northern Ireland um, for, for those that are deaf, uh, and you didn't believe that they were doing enough um, to lobby us uh, um, in, in the Assembly. Um, on your behalf, just if you want, if you can make comment on that, maybe Raymond as well. And also, I just want to say as well that we have received a timetable for bills, uh, and it's in our paper again this week. And nowhere on that is there anything in relation to a sign language bill. Um, I know uh, that uh, certainly as chair of this committee, and I would imagine when we go on to discuss this committee, we'll be somewhat um, dismayed about that because it is something that we have been we have spoken about from this committee um, w was formed back again back last January. So it's just if you want to make comment on, on both of those issues. OK, Raymond's going to comment. Actually, Jeff said, I'm just, I just want to, um, before I do pass on to Raymond, just say, and, and just say this, first of all, that 
When it comes to deaf organisation, I don't think it's the. I don't think it's fair to say that they haven't maybe done enough on our behalf. I don't think that's a fair statement. The deaf organisations have priorities, and those priorities very often come from London because they're national bodies. It would be lovely to have a local solution, or a bit more flexibility, or to have some lo more local responsibility for those organisations. It would be lovely if they could be given that, that autonomy. The problem is they are national bodies who set the priorities, and very often it's hard to, to, to do anything around that. The likes of the VRS, for example, in England and Scotland and Wales, we do know that within their head office in London, don't believe that there's any further work needed in VRS because those areas are much more advanced than, say, we are here. But for us, it's a massive priority, but for them, it's not. So that's just an issue. It's not so much that they're not doing enough for us. They are governed, essentially, as a national body. We have very different priorities. So whenever it comes to uh, the Northern Ireland office, they are taking direction from those national bodies, which maybe don't have a full understanding of the issues here. So it's, it's more about governance. It's more about operations. And the problem is the, the voice of the staff in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is going to be quite a small branch of these larger companies. It's very hard for their voice to get heard. Sometimes it does get drowned out with those bigger policies and procedures. I think that's maybe more the issue. Raymond, do you want to comment on anything? Now Raymond's going to speak. Can we bring Raymond into the spotlight? There we go. Okay. Just if we do have any issues here in Northern Ireland, we do like to go to a deaf organisation. They will then say, well, we have to then go and bring this up nationally. Another thing is maybe we want to do some lobbying to the government about specific things, and they're saying they can't. Maybe there's a conflict of interest because they're funded by a certain body, and they feel slightly destabilised doing that, which is why we set up an impartial campaigns group so that we can do that. We are not a charity. We are an impartial group of volunteers who are not compromised in any way, which means we feel freer to speak and campaign. OK. We move on then. Is that OK? Hold on just one wee minute. Um, OK. Um, just to remind members that... Uh, Christina will need to repeat members' questions back when going to a member. Okay, that's all right. Um, can I thank you, um, Jeff and Raymond, for being with me today? I'm going to now open this up to <coughs> members. And first of all, we have Kelly. Can we bring Kelly in? There we go. Hi, thank you. I won't sign any further because my sign language classes have been delayed thanks to coronavirus. I think Jeff can't see my can't see. Rock, rock. Oh, I know Jeff can't see. Oh, Jeff can't see the interpreter. Okay. Are we okay again? You okay, Kelly? Can you see now? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'll I'll repeat. Um, I'll not sign any further because my um, sign language Sorry. classes have stopped Sorry. due to coronavirus. Oh no! One moment, Kelly. Sorry. Go ahead, Christina. Uh, I don't think the gentleman can see me. <laughs> okay. Yes, they need to be able to see Christina. So can we bring Christina into the spotlight? Yeah. There we go. Can we try again, Kelly? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah. Can Jeff and Raymond both see? Yeah, they need. Uh, to... uh, no, no, uh, not They again. need to see Christina only because Christina is signing to them, so they're not necessarily see you or anyone else. They need to see Christina. So, if just if we can just have Christina uh, on show, please. All right, Kelly, go ahead. I'll try again. I will check again. Can Jeff and Raymond both see the interpreter? Yes. 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 There we go. Oh, Jeff, Jeff just sent. Sorry if he could interrupt. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh. Yes. That's us now. Okay. At last. 
Thank you for your patience. Um, uh, and it's gone off again. It's gone off again. Oh, I think it's, it's something to again. do with our system. Can I just? Um, uh, it, we need to make sure that the signers can see Christina, or sorry, that Jeff and Raymond can see Christina at all times, no matter who is speaking. So can we try it yeah. again? Jeff's just saying, is there any way we can use the twin spotlight? There we go. Jeff knows more about this than any of the rest of us. Uh, if we can use the twin, or do we need to pause for a few moments, or what's? Hold on, two text members. Just bear with us. One minute. <laughs> it wouldn't be the committee for communities if there wasn't an issue with our uh, technology. I'm really send to see what we need to, to do. <laughs> Jeff's in, that's it. That seems to be okay oh, now. There we go. We've got everybody uh, on great. screen now. Good stuff. We'll, we'll give that a go. That's great. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, Kelly, go ahead. Thank you for your patience. And this is one example of how technology. Oh, oh, oh it's gone, gone again. again. It's gone again. <laughs> Bear with us. <laughs> We have the we have problems every week with our technology, so we're we're well used to this. Oh, so I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> the repeating of the questions is so that broadcasting can sort out. I, you, I can't hear you. Go ahead. Sorry. The repeating of the questions is so that spot our broadcasting can sort out. You know. We have in the frame, but if we've got everybody in the frame now, we're maybe okay. Well, we did have everyone in the frame, but yeah. it's gone again. Can we put? I don't know if broadcasting can do that for us. Can put everybody in the frame. That um, so, Jeff, <coughs> Raymond, Kelly, and Christina. Can that be a, a joint frame? I don't know. I know they're listening to me. Hopefully. <laughs> or do we need to allow Kelly to ask her question, then go to Christi or then ask Christina to interpret um, after that, or what that's way? An option. Broadcasting has said that the witnesses need to go to their layout view at their end. Okay, witnesses. That, so Jeff and Raymond, can you go to your layout view? And I would assume that would be for the layout to have everybody on screen. To change to grid. Change to grid. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> uh, you can. I can drop down from the top layout. And grid. Apparently, I can do this. <laughs> and we're okay to take time over this. This is we're not running any rush. Just speak up. <laughs> Well, we pause for two minutes just to we have a conversation with Pi who are coming in through the back door as we speak. <laughs> Members, I'm just going to pause the meeting for, for for a couple of moments. I'm just going to go off here for a couple of moments. This is the Northern oh. Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. No. Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland. Okay, members, we we might have this resolved. Um, let me just see. Oh goodness, we've lost. Um, we've lost. Oh, can we bring Raymond into the spotlight, please? He's in the audience at the minute. There, Raymond's back in our spotlight again. 
Um, uh, can, Christina, can you ask Raymond, was he able to get his screen onto grid? Yes. yes. Oh, good. Well done. Good. Yes. So we can go ahead on the grid format and we'll try that. If that doesn't work, the way we're going to do it is the members on Starleaf will ask their question. I will then repeat the question um, and that brings the, 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 the cameras back into the Senate chamber. But we'll try, we'll go first with uh, the grid format. So again, Kelly, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Um, I use this system on a regular basis to lip read. Oh, Raymond having problems. Um, I use this system as a regular basis to lip read um, so I can have a small um, consideration of how difficult it is for you. Um, but thank you very much um, for your information today. It's very valuable. Uh, one, I have three questions. Uh, the first one is during coronavirus, we have had, um, obviously, people are not able to get together. How much impact has that had on you and others in Northern Ireland when translators have not been able to go to homes and when the rest of Northern Ireland has developed using Zoom and other online platforms? How has this impacted when translators cannot um, be provided for yourselves? Uh, Jeff's going to respond. So, yes, COVID hit this time last year. And in some ways, which is very exciting, is that it's helped access for us. So before deaf people in Northern Ireland couldn't phone their doctor, they couldn't phone through to their hospital. They were constantly having to go to their doctors to make a doctor's appointment. Thanks to the contract that was set up, now there's a VRS service and deaf people lives have been transformed by this access. There are other areas that are difficult and that's maybe the case where deaf people can't go out and socialise and it's the case also that they can't even speak to their neighbours or anything like that or if they want to ask somebody about what's going on, their neighbours, you know, we're all a bit frightened of each other at the moment, aren't we? Now, also, what you did mention there, Kelly, about lip reading. You'll understand how difficult lip reading is when there's masks or when people are standing at least two metres apart. So yes, there have been actually some really nice things that have come out of COVID, but there are also a lot of struggles, a lot of difficulties. Deaf people will always find a way to meet up and talk. Previous to COVID, we wouldn't have thought about doing that on Zoom, but actually now we were utilising Zoom too. We are utilising Zoom. Um, now I have to say though, the biggest transformation for deaf people is having this ability to have autonomy over their own lives, to be able to speak to their doctors and that by themselves via phone call. It's absolutely fantastic. There are other areas, for example, I think when you have access in one area, it, it highlights other areas where you don't have access, the likes of police or that. People really do feel that is such a gap now that they know how easy it is to phone your doctor or to make those calls. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my second question then leads very, I wanted to hear that because what this um, confirms for me is that the barrier um, of having access to video services has basically been removed because of coronavirus and while it has been an awful time and an isolating time, um, we are all used to using online relay services. So the next natural step would be to have a central point with an interpreter for anyone who needs it. Um, I wanted to ask about that interpreter service. Um, you've talked already about so many different um, providers using different apps. We have um, the text phone system, which is one phone number that you can add on to anyone's phone number and you can have text phone, that relay service. Is, there, is that how it works in Scotland, where it's a, a number that you attach to a phone number or before a phone number, um, so that the person can access that one service? Uh, 
Raymond, do you want to answer that? No, no, Jeff, you, you answer it. So for the VRS in Scotland, how it works is just that last bit. You're just asking technically how you do that. Is that the case? Sorry, because the interrupter yeah. uh, jumped up there. My screen went big. You're just basically asking how, how you uh, actually contact yeah. it. Mm -hmm. OK, absolutely. Great question. Let me see. So I'm just going to show you exactly how it works. So you have an app downloaded on your phone. And have some of you used uh, FaceTime? I'm sure you have. Face you have. OK. So it's essentially the same, same principle. You click on a button which takes you to an app and within seconds an interpreter is on your screen. So you'll see the interpreter on the screen via the app, the specific app, the specific company that has a contract. And from that interpreter you can make any call you want. You just give that interpreter yeah. the number and you don't need to give them any specific number, it's just the, the number because it's just there using a, a normal telephone system. And interpreter dials that number. And essentially then what they do is the interpreter does have the interpreter will have their headset on. So this is what you see. Kind of a blue background, the interpreter has their headset on and the interpreter will call through say, I'm a sign language interpreter, I have a deaf lady on the phone uh, who wants to, what, if it's a plumber, make an appointment with you to see if you can come out to my house. That sort of a thing. It's that easy. It's that easy. So we have an interpreter now, Christina. Can you imagine? It's, essentially, this is a bit like VRS because we're both in our homes, Kelly, and we're going through a, a central interpreter. It works very similar to that. The only difference is obviously you're phoning the interpreter. So you, you, can, you can phone the emergency services, you can phone anybody in Scotland, and it is fantastic. I know in the likes of France and America, they use the very same system for lip speakers as well, which is really mm -hmm. helpful mm -hmm. for those people who do speak uh, and, but can't hear the phone. So there are so many things that you can do within this technology. If you're a deaf person who likes to speak and use your voice, you can still use your voice, but lip read the lip speaker and go through it that way rather than using an interpreter. It, it really is quite fantastic, a lot of potential. And a lot of barriers have been overcome, thank goodness. Um, one of the barriers that I would be concerned about is we see it currently within our school system when the children, whenever they um, go to have a class online, that because of data protection, um, the teacher may not be able to be seen and the child, if they, especially if they're in their bedroom, they shouldn't have their cameras on. I was just wondering um, if that was a barrier, but how you have described the system means that that's irrelevant. So data protection shouldn't be a problem. Has that ever come up in any of the other um, GB nations? That's a great question. Uh, so the only people who are, say, for example, able to see that deaf person, wherever they are in their home or that, is the interpreter. The hearing person can't see. They yeah. don't have any access to, to the video call. Essentially what that means is all interpreters are professionals. They have their enhanced police checks. They have gone through training, they're impartial, they're confidential. When it also comes to uh, the interpreter's home, the interpreters are all vetted. Also their homes are vetted if they are working from home mm. so that nobody else can see the calls that are going on. It has to be highly confidential. It is very, very strict. That's what that is. When it comes to like the school environment, it does make it difficult. And can I just say that it is very difficult for deaf children accessing school at the moment remotely. And that is something that does need to be sorted out because for data protection reasons, cameras are turned off. And it means then that maybe a teacher can be seen if they're in the classroom, but the child misses out on all that cl classroom interaction with their peers. 
that is a problem for online remote learning for deaf children. I have to say that's a big, big thing that has come up throughout the pandemic. Thank you. I'm, through um, your presentation, I was shocked to find out that um, translations were not available through some of the advice services. And this pandemic has created such economic crisis for so many people who need advice. Um, so as an outcome of our meeting, um, I'm given a lot of heart that there is an easy solution, but there's also more investment needed in the advice sector. Um, I'm wondering, the person who's translating obviously will be a good um, translator, but do they need any additional qualifications or help um, in order to translate, um, especially when it comes to the complex issue of benefit system, housing, and so on. Um, I believe that the way that the system works shouldn't require that to interpreter to have to have technical training, but do you think that there would be any other assistance that we should be investing in for interpreters so that they can cover the whole range of um, advice and help those advice network people to translate for them? Yes, absolutely. Um, I can I can answer that. So the likes of CAB, that's a really good good thing to bring up, and it's a very good point about possibly training and extra training that may need to happen. Though I would ask and wonder that, that really is that necessary? It's probably not. What may be a great investment is that you would train up some deaf people to become CAB advisors. In England, for example, there are at least 12 people who work in CAB and they're advisors. They're deaf advisors. They work and cover the whole of the country for deaf people. And they are deaf. So you're giving deaf people employment opportunities there, but also you're not needing then interpreters and all of that. And that direct communication is fantastic. So when it comes uh, to to training and that interpreters are trained, they're professional, but it would be wonderful to see some opportunities for deaf people within this, because why could a deaf person not be an advisor? Raymond. Yes, and it's not only the likes of Citizens Advice Bureau, it's different helplines as well. There's a lot of helplines out there that people access, and it would be wonderful if they could be a bit more accessible via VRS. You know, there's Lifeline, these sorts of things, which don't have VRS interpreted services within them. Just one more thing, just very briefly. My son lives in France. And he told me recently that in France, in hearing call centres, deaf people are actually employed and trained up to work in a call centre. So if you need to call through any call centre or helpline, if a deaf person comes through the line, they get transferred to the deaf person. And I just think that's a lovely system. And do you know what? It makes so much more sense. Because just think about it. There are different languages employed in these companies. And why would you not employ sign language as well? I agree. Um, one last thing just to ask, you mentioned um, access to employment. So if someone um, uses sign and they're a business person, um, I just wonder the, the current access to employment level of funding, is that a case that the funding is not enough to cover um, all of the aspects of translation within the working life? Or is it that access to employment is not available for people who need sign, you know, sign language interpreters? Okay, Raymond's going to just answer this. Access to work 
is a big issue in Northern Ireland. I, I do have to say, we hear this all the time from deaf people. They're saying that they're given a very low budget. I know one deaf person, they live here in Northern Ireland, they have been asking and asking for access to work for their work, and they're just saying, I think they're given maybe two to four hours. They moved to England to get a job because they get a full-time interpreter alongside them. Four hours. So that, or else they'll maybe get up to 30 to 40 hours a week. So that's wonderful. Wow. So you can just imagine the opportunity you have when you don't have an interpreter, when you can't communicate with anybody in your workplace. It's so difficult. So we don't, we, a lot of people who are business people or who work in slightly higher profile jobs will move to England because they cannot do their jobs here with a level of access to work. They cannot, they will have no chance of being promoted because they can't, they cannot do their work as effectively if they don't have communication. So what happens is they go to England because in England access to work is much more generous. They're given what they need in England. Here it just seems to always be a battle for some reason. Yeah. Uh, I, I understand um, and you have explained it so well. Um, that's me finished. Um, thank you very much for all your answers. It has certainly helped me to understand why um, VRS is critical in moving forward. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, I have Sinead, then Karen, then Mark. So if we can bring Sinead into the spotlight, please. There we go. Hello. Thank you for the presentation. Um, listen, I think if we ever needed uh, an example of how difficult communication is for, for people who have a your deaf, then I think today's committee session um, has been a, a good example of that. Um, I have to say, I'm really annoyed actually um, to hear that the technology just isn't in place here uh, that allows deaf people to participate fully in life um, and have access to the same uh, services uh, that, that hearing people do. Uh, as we said at the start of the, the briefing, we only got the, the, the table paper with, with your briefing um, as the, the meeting was starting. Um, but I, I see from a, a quick look at it that my own council area, which is Murray Morning Down, and isn't listed as one of the five councils and, um, that is currently offering access to a, a, a VRS system. So I suppose... Um, being parochial, uh, you know, if my if my, if Newry Morning Down, if my local council wanted to, um, you know, offer that service, where did they get the ball rolling on that? Um, you know, where do they start so that uh, deaf people in Newry Morning Down can have access to to VRS and have access to the services provided by our local council? Yes, of course, I can answer that, no problem. Can you see me okay? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I think possibly the best person that you could contact would be a gentleman called Michael Johnston. He works uh, for langu the Language and Equality Department in the Belfast City Council. They were the first council to start using this service, and then other councils got on board as well. I do believe there's five or six councils, five councils in Northern Ireland who use the VRS. So I think Michael in Belfast City Council would be a good person to contact to explain the process. Okay, thank you. And, and thank you for your briefing today. Much appreciated. Thank you, Sinead. Um, can we now then bring Karen into the spotlight, please? There we go. Thank you, Chair. Hi. Thanks, Raymond and Jeff, for your clear and concise presentation today. And sorry for the technical difficulties, um, as, as others have alluded to. Um, uh, my party colleague, Carol Nicullen, um, when she was minister and throughout even still, is, as you know, very supportive and proactive in relation to promoting and improving services for the deaf community. In 2016, under her department in Detail, they launched a sign, sign language framework. Um, Jeff, uh, I wanted to ask in relation to 
that framework? How effective has it been? Has the objectives been met? Um, I see one of the objectives is uh, deaf hubs in Derry and Belfast. Have they been established and are they working? Okay, so on the deaf hubs. I can answer that, absolutely, yes. Uh, and interestingly, uh, Carol, your colleague, has been wonderful and at the very start we thought this would be in the remit of health and then obviously department for uh, communities at that time they then started to take the lead there were for example three benefits that were covered by a vrs and that was it but now all the benefits now have access to vrs services which is fantastic and whenever you're talking specifically about the framework and the deaf hubs from what i am aware of now i am not completely sure about the situation now but at the moment there's a lot more discussion about this and i know up in derry there is the foil deaf center and it's up and running it may be the case though that 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 can in the future become a hub within belfast i believe there has been no work or no action around that there's been nothing done maybe it's still at a discussion phase but from what i know there's been no movement whatsoever on that we do know that hands that talk who are based in dungiven they're a deaf organization there has been no movement there so I just am aware that there hasn't been anything done centrally around any sort of hub or that. Down in Fermanagh and Oma, everything there is, is very much more independent. The FOIL Sign Language Hub, they're independent. They aren't really led or funded by, by the government or they wouldn't really constitute that sort of a hub that's in the framework. Thank you both for, for that. I know um, of the great work of both of those organisations, but I also know of the struggles they face in relation to funding, very short term, year on year as well, um, Jeff and Raymond. So that is, is something that needs to be rectified. Um, and I suppose uh, in relation to, you spoke of the many improvements, but um, still too many gaps in relation to access to services and everyday life issues um, that deaf people face, and particularly, you know, um, very, very relevant to highlight in, in relation to our children, um, access in school, um, very, very difficult at the minute. Um, for, for those and a year under the pandemic I just find it shocking that we are still talking about that and it wasn't put in place immediately that support um, uh, just so I just really hope that there has been lessons learned from that to every woman and we pick up certainly for myself um, uh, you talk very much there about the Scottish model um, I will follow up um, in relation to my other party colleague Deidre Hardy because I also know that she has been very supportive as well um, and I know as a committee here today, we will read the, the, the briefing paper that you have provided and also follow up. But once again, thank you both for attending today. Thank you. OK, thank you, Karen. Thank you very much. Um, can we bring Mark into the spotlight, please? Good morning. Uh, thank you guys for your presentation and thank you also for your patience and perseverance. Uh, many of the uh, questions now ha have been asked by colleagues on the committee, but I'm just uh, maybe looking for a wee bit more detail in terms of the Scottish model. Have you an, any idea, like, like it's funded centrally, have, have we any idea of the cost of that, how much government support goes into it, and have any costings been done on how much a similar model would cost here in Northern Ireland? Yes, absolutely. In 2015, I do believe it was about 330,000 a year. Since then, I believe, now I'm not sure about the exact costings because I'm very much out of the business, I'm out of the scene. I, um, 
I, I don't know exactly the detail. I did try to find out, but I wasn't able to for today. But I do hope that maybe one of your staff, one of your officials, can access that information. But back in 2015, I do know that was the cost. And I think uh, it's obviously sensitive, it's commercially sensitive, which is why I wasn't able to access it that easily. And Raymond's saying if he could just come in. Mark, it's maybe uh, good to contact somebody within Scotland, but also in Dublin. In Dublin, Iris have the system as well. It's quite, they, we're maybe talking about quite a similar system uh, to Northern Ireland. And also, it may rectify some of those problems that we have around shortage of ISL interpreters. If we could yeah. be accessing and working in partnership with a company like Iris, it could, it could really transform access for ISL. Jeff wants to just come back in, if possible. OK, thank you so much, Raymond, for that. That's absolutely true. We did uh, do consultations with people. I spoke to one person in OMA. This person is an ISL user and has said that they phoned through this. They, they needed a passport renewed and they weren't able to make contact because there's no VRS in Northern Ireland for the passport services. So used then Iris in the south of Ireland and got through and was able then, it was an Irish passport that she was applying for, was able then to get that. So that's why we can see there's, there, there's also lovely opportunities for partnership as well, as well. So Iris have been running this VRS. It has been up and running. It's very successful. So there may be a way of, of somehow for Northern Ireland using that contract and working with them to, to try and increase our Irish Sign Language interpreters. For any BSL users up here, we already have a great pool of interpreters who are working within the Health and Social Care Board contract. That's a resource that can be built upon. There's already capacity there. And I don't think it would cost a lot more to up that service to increase VRI services. It wouldn't cost a lot more than maybe what's been paid now. Yeah, I, I, I believe there are great opportunities that exist through enhanced collaboration and uh, cooperation, not just in terms of, I suppose, maximising the benefit of, of any investment, uh, maximising the access that people who need these services can get to them, but also in ensuring uh, consistency uh, some degree of, of, of uniformity. So we haven't got such a, a lottery when it comes to accessing services. But thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, can I then ask that Alex be brought into the spotlight, please? Um. Hello, um, thank you, Jeff and Raymond, for your presentation. Um, it was it was really good to hear about the issues that the deaf community are having. Um, I was very pleased to see that my council in Ards and North Down um, have the VAR the VAR, the the VAR system. So that that was good because I was going to tell them off if they hadn't. <laughs> Um, just a couple of questions for you in, in terms of the PSNI. I, I, I was concerned to hear that they didn't have a system in place. So would it help if our committee was to maybe write to the chief constable or the policing board um, to ask about this and to urge them to put something in place for you is my first question. And my second question is, how have the deaf community been coping during the COVID pandemic? Has there been any issues with GP services or accessing um, hospital appointments or things like that? Um, can, can you give me some experiences of that and if that needs looked at as well? Thank you very much. Rita's just going to uh, comment on this, Alex, please. Uh, 
Yes, whenever uh, lockdown started, there was real panic within the deaf community as to how we would contact those in the health services because we couldn't go into GP surgeries, for example. Uh, there are stories where people went up and were ringing the bell to try and speak to a receptionist. And the receptionist was shouting back, you know, and trying to say, you know, we're, you're not allowed to be here. And deaf people were saying yes, but we need to try and make we need to try and make some sort of appointments with that. So it, it was very very difficult, and deaf people were being chased from their GP actually. And we're trying to say we need to make appointments and we need to speak to our GPs, and it was very very stressful. We weren't allowed in to see doctors. It was it was quite traumatic, I would say, quite traumatic for the deaf community. And that's what it's like now with the police, because we cannot contact the police. Now, whenever the Health and Social Care Board set up the contract with the interpreter now, our lives were transformed. Such a relief to be able to now access all of all, anything within that remit of the Health and Social Care. But we need the same for the police. We need the same for the police. We don't want to have to go up to the police as well, because if hearing people can make a call, we should be able to do that too. We shouldn't have to go up to a police station maybe to report something very minor or not minor. And, you know, if you have to contact the police anyway, you may be in a difficult situation. And this just adds to the stress. And also, who wants to go to a police session if they don't have to? So it just, it's about giving us our independence so that we can do what we need to do without having to rely on anybody else. I suppose it comes down to protecting our privacy and our dignity as well. And you know, say for example, if I want to speak to my bank via VRS, it's lovely because I can go and do that without having to ask somebody to make a call for me and to know my business. You know, we all do deserve this. We all do deserve this. Now, I have to say, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was a very difficult time. There was just so many restrictions and we had no access. But now things are slowly improving, but we want to see that filtered out to other services. Um, Jeff's just saying thank you for that, Rita. That's very, very helpful. And it's just what Rita said there at the end that's so important to pick up on. And Alex, just as you did mention there, you would be keen to send through some sort of correspondence to the policing board or the chief constable. We would really appreciate that. That would be fantastic if you did. And you're saying it is like a, a, a postcode lottery. Some things have access, some things don't. It's difficult. It really is difficult. So even if we set up the police, that would be another very useful contract. There are still services that don't have that. What we would love is an approach where we just try and get a service that gives access to everything at the same time, because in doing that, it's much more cost effective rather than paying out all these different contracts, which will add up to a greater total than one service, one service, one point of contact where you can access similar accesses which you can do in Scotland. And also it's the case that deaf people are saying, well, what does and what doesn't and what apps use for this and who deaf and how deaf on this? One button to give you access like anybody else has is such an excellent solution. It's cost effective, but it's also transforming for deaf people's lives. Rita just wants to say something else, if that's okay. Yes, and say for example, we uh, had a deaf person who phoned through to interpreter now, and they said, "Could you phone a specific service of the police?" And the interpreter, interpreter now has to say, "Look, we we can't, because our remit is very, very restricted." And then the deaf person will say, "Well, how can I phone them?" And it's very hard for a deaf person, or the interpreter, then to say, "Well, you can't, you can't." It's very, very difficult. So also the, the confusion, especially for our older deaf people, having to download maybe three or four apps and navigate all of that, it's quite stressful. So just one point of contact, one provider would really, really be wonderful. Okay, thank you. And Jeff's just going to come in with one more thing. And yes, but I'm not saying no to the police, I'm saying absolutely. If you, if you can contact them, that would be wonderful. Okay, okay. Alex. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Alex. Okay, that's all our members in Stardew. Um I think, Robin, you had wanted to make comment or ask a question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, um, thank you for coming. I really appreciate uh, it. has been a, a great learning exercise for me. Um, uh, and indeed, uh, I think there have been 
any valuable suggestions that have been made by members o over the course of, of, of this, this meeting. I do want to, and I think it, coming here is a good thing, but it's even better if we can get actions such as have been suggested by Alex. Um, and, and I do want to see if we could agree with you or via the chair that we as a committee could follow up on, on your behalf. And there were several points made which are disappointing that Northern Ireland's place within the national bodies um, is perhaps not at the appropriate profile that you think it should be. Uh, and I'm sure that we could agree with that. Whoever the Westminster Minister is with that responsibility, with the permission of the committee and through the chair, I think it might be appropriate for us to write to the, that minister uh, and highlight Northern Ireland's case uh, within that national body. I do think there is also a, a case for a very serious look at the Scottish model that you have outlined and whether or not Northern Ireland should not be on a par uh, with the Scottish model. And, and I feel certain that uh, uh, the Minister uh, would lift that uh, item, uh, the Northern Ireland Minister, the Communities Minister would lift that item. And I cer certainly think we should seek via the Chair to clarify the amount of money that Northern Ireland is putting into the community's budget um, for this activity. And now is the time to argue the case for the budget for, for next year. In terms of, uh, I think there's also a need for Communities Minister and the Health Minister to actually communicate on the issue and decide how they can both take uh, the, the issues uh, forward uh, and really coalescing if the chair and the committee agree I think we've tried to map out a, a route that is hopefully would be helpful uh, to the deaf community and I would finally like to just say that if, if we do this and if the committee agree to this then in six months time we have an update to look at what progress has, has been made. Again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. I don't know if uh, Jeff or Raymond want to come back on anything that Robin has said. Jeff is, just wants to respond, please. Just what you have said there is absolutely clear, concise, and it's wonderful. It is. It's excellent. I would like to bring in some context to think what each of the council pay for their contract, to think what the Health and Social Care Board pay for their contract, to think what the Department for Communities are putting into the contracts. If you add up all of those, you may see that it's maybe even more than what a central service with access to everything would cost. Now, I will also say that six months is, is a great time frame. The other thing I would say is, as Raymond has said, the Deaf Campaigns team are happy to work with any officials. Now, if we can make this process easier for yourselves, we are happy to lend whatever support is needed. Very happy to do so. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Jeff. I just then just want to wrap up this meeting for today, and I think Robin is absolutely right. I think all of the members Excuse would me. be sorry. Sorry, sorry chair. I just see Raymond just. Uh, oh, sorry, Raymond. Say yes. that. Apologies absolutely. for that. Apologies. Uh, Raymond just wants to say that the campaigns group. We have been funded to do different activities. That funding ends on the thirty-first of March. My question would be, is there a way that other money could become available to keep this group going? 
Unfortunately, the funding does come to an end, 31st of March, but we really see value in what we do and the different projects we do. I have to, again, reiterate my thanks to yourselves for having us here today. This has been a wonderful meeting, very, very productive, something we really appreciate. We really appreciate having this access to yourselves. Thank you for having the interpreter on board today. It's much appreciated by ourselves and all the deaf community. Thank you. It has been our absolute pleasure to have you here today. And we, there are some actions that will be taken forward from today. Um, we know that we also, this committee also has responsibility when it comes to our councils as well. So we can write to all of our councils to ask um, about their systems and about the lack of their systems in some of our councils. Also around those costs, I think you made a very good point there about all of the different costs for all of the different uh, departments and what they're doing. Um, so that are, that is a, that's other questions that this committee can ask. And we do know that our minister has responsibility mm -hmm. for the Sign Language Act or the Sign Language Bill. But I do believe it is our entire assembly and our entire executive that have the responsibility when it comes to VRS, because this covers all of our departments. So I think, as a committee, um, we we will get agreement, and I, uh, once once she's are gone, we'll get that agreement from everyone, and um, that we write to our executive and ask our executive what they are doing um, to progress the VRS system right across the board, because um, we can't expect all of our councils to have all of this in place if we are not doing it here as an assembly as well across all departments, which will cover. Mm -hmm every department and that covers the justice side as well and the police um, so that is that is a commitment that we can give to you from this committee and um, we have learned so much from you here today and um, you know we, we've just we've just heard from you just the difficulties that you face on all of those basic daily issues that come up in all of our lives so thank you again and um, we, we hopefully will have you back with us in the not too distant future to get an update. And Raymond certainly will also ask that question around funding uh, and how that uh, how that your group progress um, come the end of March. So thank you for being with us here today. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, members. Um, uh, we can bring, I think then, we say bye bye and we can bring members in. And apologies, members, for not coming back to you there. Um, I, had, I was under strict instructions to stick to Starleaf and then go into the room because it was just going to be difficult to come back again. So I see, Kelly, you have your hand up. Did you want to make another comment? I was just going to say, following that presentation, Chair, I think it would be useful if we actually ask the Minister for Communities the point that was made about advice services and the provision of VRS. Um, I know that the advice services monthly is going to be extremely tight given the number of calls that they are fielding. Um, I would be keen to write to the Minister to ask that there is additional money Money, not that the advice services have to then find it out of their own budget, but additional money to ensure that the deaf community are provided with an equal um, opportunity to contact advice services through VSL, especially those who sign. Yeah, and I thought it was a really good point as well that was made that we shouldn't be training people up in sign language. We should be employing people from the community um, because they know more than anybody um, the issues that are faced there. So I think that is something that we need to follow up on as well. Um, are members content with um, my, what I had said at the end of there, that very much this is an entire executive, an entire assembly issue, not just for our own minister or for the Minister for Health, albeit um, a lot of it falls under them? Are they happy enough then that we write to the executive? Um, to yeah. ask about the, uh, to, to further this issue, issue, and I think it's one of the another one of the issues, members. If you're in agreement that we don't allow it to slip off our table, um, we have heard from from today, and yeah, I, 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 it really has brought home to me, which I know it will have with all members, just the difficulties these people face. So we're happy enough then with with where we are. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Who wants to speak? 
Chair, if I could put on there on, on Kelly's point um, around the advice sector, it was something I was going to raise. And I, I, I do agree with Kelly, but you know, regardless um, of whether there's extra investment or not, when contracts have been given out for funding, this should be part of it. Um, it shouldn't then have to wait for extra funding. I know we're in a situation at the moment where we're going forward for a new, you know, a new round of funding, and, and it's certainly the time to put it in. But it should always be factored in to contracts for funding that is going out in the future. Um, just if we could add that. Thank you, Chair. No, I think that's a, a good point as well. Alex, you wanted to make a point also. Yeah, um, can I just check? Can, can we still write to the police as well? Just, just as well. I'd yeah. be happy with that. Yeah, and, and I agree with that. It's been done as well. Yeah, and I think it'd be worthwhile for all of us to speak to our own police and board members as well um, to highlight the yeah. issue. Uh, members, I, I forgot to, for, for, to thank Christina, who, who has already left, um, for the excellent work that she has done here today. So, on behalf of the committee, can I thank Christina and also thank you again to Janice and Antoinette, who I know worked very, very hard, and also our people in Pi, because this has not been an easy, and it should be easy. This should not be a difficult thing for any committee to have to do, but we have had to jump through hoops and we have had, you know, it, 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 unbelievable the amount of work has gone in to have this session here today. So a big thank you to everybody that is involved. Members, with your permission, I would like to just take a short break while we just prepare um, for our next witness uh, session. Thank you. Sure, sure, just, sorry, before that, I'll sorry, Robin, the... you are sitting way over to my side and I can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that is a good thing. <laughs> sure, the, the, we, whoever the Westminster Minister is yeah. with responsibility for this, I just want to check that he or she is on the list for communication. Yeah, yeah. yeah we've yeah. got that down as well. Okay, members, um, very, very quickly, and uh, we'll be back with you shortly. Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme sound. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This okay, members, um, we're now going to move to our last three bill evidence sessions. But before we do that, I would ask that you turn to your table papers to page 8, where there is a memo on how we propose to handle committee deliberations on the bill, which start next week. Um, we briefly discussed this a few weeks ago and noted that it would be sensible to consider the clause by subject category 
rather than the strict numerical order at this stage. Um, the, table in the, mem the table in the memo lists the categories, so we could start next week by looking at the clauses relating to permitted hours for licensed premises and registered clubs, and then move on to clauses relating to reg maybe regulation clauses and go forth that way. Um, you will receive papers from the committee team before next week's meeting, summarising the key issues on each of the clauses. Um, that have been raised through the written and oral briefing submissions that we have received already. And once all the deliberations are complete over the next um, few weeks, we will then conduct a formal clause by clause process, and that then will be in numerical order. And uh, department officials and the Assembly Bill Clerk will be in attendance for all of those deliberations. Um, members, have you any comments? Or are you content that we proceed with that approach? Content. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, members. There is also a tabled departmental paper on the department's evaluation plan for the bill. The reply states that it is too early to provide any detail on the evaluation plan, as the bill will undoubtedly change as it makes its way through the legislative process. Early discussions have taken place with officials in professional services unit, who are the experts in this area on the types of availability of information which, many, which may be required to form a baseline. Um, I, I suppose my only comment on that is when we heard last week from Stirling University, they had said that actually in order to do any sort of um, evaluation, uh, they need to have data gathered now. Um, so I suppose it would just be asked, are they gathering that data now? I know they're saying it's still too early, but um, the, 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 in order to compare and contrast, they need to have data available. Um, so members, any comments, or are they content to note that? Content. Content. Okay, members, we are now going to move in then and go to our, our first witness session on the for a briefing on the licence and registration of clubs amendment bill. And I'd like to welcome the Institute of Public Health Ireland to the committee today. And can I welcome then Helen McAvoy and Joanna Purdy? Um, you are both very welcome. Um, can I then ask if you would just uh, do some open, opening remarks? You've got a maximum of five to ten minutes on this, and then members then will ask you some questions. So please go ahead. Great. Um, thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Uh, my name is Hal. My name is Helen McAvoy and I'm here with my colleague Joanna Purdy. We work together in the policy team in the Institute of Public Health. Uh, thank you very much to the chair and the members of the committee for the invitation to present today. Uh, the Institute is an all-island body that informs public policy to support healthier populations in Ireland and Northern Ireland. And we have offices in Dublin and Belfast and are jointly funded by the Departments of Health in both jurisdictions. Um, by way of an opening statement, uh, Alcohol is not an ordinary commodity, and that is why a higher level <clears throat> of regulation around its sale is needed, uh, particularly with regard to the protection of children. Uh, from a public health perspective, licensing regulations do offer an opportunity to address patterns of consumption by through regulation of patterns of sale. Uh, the last 12 months have been incredibly challenging for many people as a result of the pandemic um, and including those employed in the pub, club and restaurant sector. And it's understandable that measures be put in place to support the recovery of that sector. However, we feel that care is needed in the selection of measures which support recovery, but also support uh, and protect public health. So uh, in today's presentation, I had intended to focus on sort of seven points, four of which are sort of general points about the bill and the others are specific to the clauses. So uh, if, uh, if the chair is happy, would I go ahead with that or did you want to pause at this point? No, please go ahead. Great. So the first point, I suppose, relates to the relationship between alcohol licensing and public health. And uh, it is our view that sort of measures that make alcohol easier to buy do facilitate more drinking and more drinking can drive more harms. And, and that's a relationship that has been recognized by the World Health Organization. Um, alcohol licensing also has some longer term influence on norms around drinking. So, for example, making alcohol available in cafes and cinemas and sporting venues can fundamentally change the experience of these activities and create additional opportunities for drinking occasions. Um, when we in public health look at alcohol related harm, we think about the population as a whole. and. Um, 
uh, nearly two thirds of, of people in Northern Ireland report that alcohol related antisocial behaviour was either a very or fairly big problem in nightlife settings. Um, the one in four people in Northern Ireland who are non drinkers, as well as the three in four that currently drink, will be both be impacted by the alcohol licensing environment. Um, at present, one in three male drinkers and one in 10 female drinkers drink above the low risk guidelines and one in 10 drinkers are in a, in, a, in, a, in a bit of bother with problematic drinking. So in summary, the drinking patterns and extent of alcohol related harms in Northern Ireland mean that caution is needed in the adoption of measures which may increase the accessibility of alcohol. Uh, my next point relates to the stated policy objective of the bill. Um, which without a clear reference to public health and safety within the stated objective of the bill, it's possible in fact that alcohol related harms could increase as a consequence of the bill and in fact the policy objective could still be met. So with that in mind, we would invite the committee to consider including some reference to the protection of public safety at least and public health ideally within the wording of the overall policy objective of the bill. Uh, my third point relates to sort of public health as a licensing objective. Um, I know that there isn't specified licensing objectives within the bill. Um, in Scotland they, and the rest of the UK, they do have licensing objectives. And in Scotland, they have public health as a stated licensing objectives. Um, if there's no scope to do this within the Northern Ireland uh, governance structures, the licensing bill could make alternative provisions to provide a meaningful role for local health authorities when licensing deliberations are made on, for example, the granting of new licenses, license renewal, and, and the granting of additional late night opening or special events licenses. Um, my next point relates to health impact assessment. Um, the Making Life Better Public Health Framework promotes a health and all policies approach. Um, and one of the tools that may be useful to the committee in this regard is health impact assessment. Uh, this is a process by which a policy can be judged as to its potential effects on the health of a population and the distribution of those effects. Um, a useful tool to balance the protection of public health with economic and social considerations. Um, and it can uh, create um, proposals around how public health harms can be mitigated. Uh, so moving on, I suppose, to the, to the more specific clauses of the bill, um, home delivery of alcohol has become <clears throat> even more of a concern in the context of the, the pandemic. And we really do welcome action being taken in that regard. It's a really important part of the bill and we, we strongly welcome that. Um, regarding self-service and vending machines, we welcome the commitment to close off what are novel avenues of alcohol supply. But we do question the scale of the impact uh, we've no data on the significance of this type of supply, but where we do have evidence, for example, we know that 11% 11 of 11 to 16 year olds in Northern Ireland who reported having alcohol bought it from a pub or club. So a focus on self-service and vending may have limited impact on reducing access, whereas greater regulation of serving practices to young people might be a better target for change and enforcement. Um, so could the licensing bill make provisions for enhanced program of test purchasing as well? Uh, or make provisions for enhanced penalties for licensed premises that are proven to serve alcohol to minors. And I suppose within that, how confident is the committee that the issues will be addressed in a voluntary code that was drafted by those with a commercial interest in the sale of alcohol rather than specified as, as components of the bill itself? Uh, regarding alcohol promotions, we welcome the proposed restriction on uh, off-sales drink promotion in supermarkets. However, similar to the other measures, this is a limited response to the broader challenge of alcohol promotion and act advertising activities. Um, and we also support the um, practical alignment of entertainment and alcohol licenses. So in summary, we do invite the committee to progress the measures in the bill as they relate to self-service and vending, promotions and home delivery. But we also invite the committee to enhance the scope of the regulatory measures in line with the evidence and with a firm commitment to statutory led monitoring and enforcement. Um, with regards to extended trading hours and special events, uh, I, the net effect of additional licensing hours may well be increased accessibility of alcohol and increased alcohol consumption. We couldn't see within the bill any limits to the number of additional special event licenses which could be granted or the number of additional trading hours per premises or per geographic area. And it's our understanding that there's no publicly available record of the number of authorizations or additional hours granted. So we invite the committee to include within the bill a commitment to share data on the application and granting of those extended drinking hours. 
So longer allowable trading hours have been tried in many other countries, including England and Wales, Australia, Iceland, and many studies have tried to capture the effect of these changes, and not all of them reach the same conclusions. Um, and from our perspective, systematic reviews provide the best way of guiding decision-making. These select the best designed research studies, pool their findings, and provide the best possible assessment on the body of good quality evidence available. Um, from this, there is some evidence that extensions of trading errors are associated with um, increased assaults and injuries, um, increased demand for policing, um, and increased demand for um, frontline services, including health services, um, so I think that that evidence does need to be taken into account. Um, we have additional concerns about the public health impact of proposals for um, alcohol licensing in sporting clubs. Um, I guess from a public health perspective, sport clubs are a real asset. They're a community asset. They support active and healthy lives, social inclusion. Um, we urge the committee to protect against creating the conditions where uh, both national sporting events and local club events are, can be transformed into drinking occasions um, through things like branding, marketing, promotions and licensing arrangements. Um, uh, I'm coming to the end, don't worry. Uh, in terms of the proposal on drinking time, um, we couldn't find any evidence really to say that extending drinking time does lead to the outcomes of reduced incidence of drinking too quickly or supporting a more gradual departure of customers. So we would invite the committee to defer the, the, the provisions for increased drinking uptime until such time as there's better evidence available on the, on the, uh, the impacts for health and social uh, outcomes and also uh, policing. So in summary, licensing reform that increases overall trading hours and creates additional opportunities for drinking occasions is likely to increase consumption. In the absence of a clear timeline for the introduction of, of minimum unit pricing uh, and broader regulation of alcohol marketing and supply, the licensing reforms as specified do have the potential to have some negative public health impacts. Um, and that concludes the uh, the presentation from me. Okay, Helen, thank you very much. Um, Joanna, have you anything to say at this stage? Are you happy enough that we go to questions? I'm happy for you to go to questions, Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you, Joanna. Um, I, I suppose uh, as part of our evidence gathering, we have wanted to strike a balance and hear from everyone in, involved. And we, we certainly have heard in some of our witness sessions about the impact on, on health and the harm related to alcohol. I suppose I just wanted to ask then, first of all, do you see, uh, does this bill, in your opinion, strike that balance um, whenever we're, we're looking at public health? And then secondly, I know you were on, you maybe heard on our call earlier um, when we had asked the department about an evaluation plan, they had said it was far too early to even to, to look at any evaluation plan. Um, yet it was something that was brought up by the University of Stirling last week when they were in briefing us, um, and also around the reviews of any of these um, measures that the department want to take. Um, do you feel that that needs to be put in um, the bill also, that the reviews must take place? Um, I suppose, firstly, on the question relating to uh, evaluation, I think, in general, the earlier we can plan for evaluation, uh, the better. Uh, there are obviously deficits in the data, but there's probably also data there that may not be fully interrogated as yet in terms of its its relevance to the to the um, to the to the bill. Um, so I suppose the earlier you can start planning evaluation, the better, because if there's data that's not being collected, the plans need to be put in place to collect it and get the baseline, and that and that would take time. Uh, for example, in, in Scotland, they have a, a monitoring program linked to the, uh, their legislation on minimum unit pricing that reports directly in. So they have set up a number of studies to examine the impacts of minimum unit pricing. Um, and that was supported by Public Health Scotland and other bodies. So there's, you know, there's a precedent to that approach being taken when new legislation on alcohol is put in place to monitor uh, the impacts in a, a sort of objective and neutral way. Um, with regards to the balance, um, I suppose the short answer would probably be from a public health perspective. Um, it depends what two agendas you're trying to balance um, from a sort of... Uh, I think there is the potential for um, increases in alcohol consumption, but that would depend very much on the degree to which the licensed premises take up the full scope of what's available in any 
essentially liberalised licensing regime. So when the Licensing Act in England and Wales went 24-hour licences, not all of the licence sector rushed out and said, we all want 24-hour licences. In fact, they, they, some of them look for quite modest extensions and so on. But I don't, I don't know whether that's the case. Um, the concern is that in the absence of knowing how the, the business sector would respond to being given the opportunity for additional licences and without any limits on the number or nature of those licences and without public health having ha a voice in the decision making, um, there's, there, there wouldn't be a balance from the public health perspective with those things in place. Um, I suppose the other, the other piece is in relation to that alcohol policy spans many different departments and um, we're obviously very keen to see minimum unit pricing um, come in uh, on an all-island basis based on very strong evidence of a success in Scotland um, to date and uh, the, the, the balance of measures around um, alcohol licensing versus pricing versus the other things all need to be taken account so there's a wider balance both across the broader alcohol policy agenda. Just to follow on then, you had mentioned there um, or to encourage us to consider um, including a, a public health as a, de a defined um, objective within the bill. Um, just a bit more detail on that and also is that any, on anywhere else, is that for example in the Scottish bill, do they have that in there? Chair, if I could just pick up on the um, question with regard to the public health licensing objective. Um, that was incorporated within the Scottish Alcohol Licensing Act, which came into effect in 2005, although I think it was some years down the line before the licensing objective um, was, was fully implemented. Obviously, their, their system is quite different. Um, they have licensing boards and they also, licensing is um, administered through local authorities, which is different to the administration um, of licences here through the court system. But I think what's important to remember, the public health um, licensing objective offers a number of potential benefits. Um, it allows um, public health and health agencies and the health sector generally to be involved in licensing decisions. These are the groups that know their they know their communities, they know the alcohol related harms that are experienced in the communities and they have the local level data and evidence and they can articulate that very well to licensing authorities to really set out what harms communities are experiencing. Um, they also have potentially the power to object to any licensing decisions um, and, and as well as that they can um, help inform either any new licensing decisions or amendment to existing licenses such as extended opening hours for example so um, it really the, the focus on, on public health data and, and local data will be is, is immensely important kind of in, in these decisions and looking at what's happening and, and what impact this is having um, both in terms of um, existing services and even any further pressure on services as well. So it's really it's an opportunity to bring health to the table in terms of licensing decisions. Okay, thank you, Joanna. Um, members, if anybody wants to ask questions, can they raise their hand on their starleaf? I only have one member at, at present who's in our room here that wants to ask questions, so can I ask members to do that? Um, I'm going to go to Robin, I think, believe you wanted to make a comment. Uh, I, I do, Chair, and thank Helen and Joanne uh, for being with us today. Um, and I want to thank you for your submission. Uh, there's a, a, a great deal of clarity uh, within it. Uh, uh, it it's a, an excellent submission, well put together. Can I? It, my question really was uh, around a, a similar issue to the uh, protection and promotion of public health, uh, the fifth objective within the Scottish uh, legislation. Uh, you, you have made the, the comment to, to the, in your report and your comments to the, the chair. The Institute would invite the Committee for Communities to carefully consider the wider public health implications in line with the, public, the protection and promotion of public health. Would you perhaps just go a wee bit more than that in terms of just invite the committee? Would you go as far as a recommendation or would you maybe just expand on what you've said there? Uh, well, I think in terms of the 
having public health as a central consideration within the bill, we identified the different mechanisms by which that could be sort of actioned, one of which was to have public safety or public health named as a key component of what of the policy objective of the bill uh, and this and the second one was to have public health as a named licensing objective so we were trying to integrate public health concerns at the highest level in terms of what the bill hopes to achieve but also within the mechanisms by which the bill will be uh, delivered and enforced at local level um, I think the concern is that um, there are uh, a number of uh, strong voices around the, the licence sector, each with their own different agenda. Um, where we're coming from is to think about the communities that will be living in that licensed environment. And we've said, you know, one in four of those adults is a non-drinker. Um, they will likely not benefit from any increase in licensing hours. Um, I suppose others argue that they might, but I, there's, the, there's um, the children that live in that community. Uh, there's the people who will be experiencing direct and indirect alcohol-related harm. So uh, from that perspective, it's, it's not just in relation to, uh, it's not a, uh, an ideological uh, approach to saying we need to reduce drinking we do need to reduce drinking or we're not going to reduce alcohol related harm but we also need to ensure that the community where everyone lives is 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 designed in a way that's right for them and within the scottish bill is there any indication that the inclusion of of, of this clause this objective has indeed proven to be successful Helen, would you just like me to respond to that? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Joanna. Yes, um, certainly implementing um, a public health licensing objective in Scotland hasn't been without its challenges. And Professor Fitzgerald, who presented to the committee last week, has published a paper back in 2017 on that. What that um, research paper highlighted was that there was success around winning hearts and minds as part of that political process and and achieving um, I got, um, sorry I'm kind of lost my train of thought it's just achieving um, success in terms of recognizing um, the importance of a focus on public health recognizing the alcohol related harms that occur in in communities when I mean, you know for example that disadvantaged communities are disproportionately affected by alcohol related harms and in fact the level of alcohol specific deaths in the most deprived communities is three times that in the least deprived communities so something like a public health objective would be hugely important in terms of looking at the availability and the accessibility of alcohol in, for example, a low income or more deprived communities in order to assess the impact that it's having on, on those particular um, individuals and families and to then consider uh, what conditions around licensing and what measures um, can be put in place to ensure that no further harm is caused as a result of increased alcohol consumption or, or increased alcohol access to alcohol. Okay, thank you, Chair. That's me completed. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you, Robin. Um, can we um, bring Kelly into the spotlight, please? Go ahead, Kelly. Oh, sorry, Chair, the sound just broke up there. Thank you very much both for um, your presentation, Joanna. I'm interested in actually just teasing out slightly further about this public health objective because it does make sense but that there's a wider issue to licensing consideration. I'm just wondering, in Scotland, um, does that translate down to consideration, for instance, when licenses are being given out by the local authority of the spatial spreading out of where those licences are, because I'm very aware we, we thankfully received uh, maps through from, from our own researchers um, that had come from elsewhere that showed where the concentration, for instance, of, of pubs and hotels are. Um, and as you can imagine, that would be in a lot of the larger towns and cities. But if Scotland were to look at this in a public health objective and thinking about 
you know, as it says there on page four of your paper or 149 of our pack, it's the prevention of crime and disorder, protection of public safety, public nuisance, protection of children from harm. If we took that, then we would perhaps not want to have such a concentration of alcohol available through those premises. Unfortunately, our current licensing system doesn't appear to take that into consideration. Do you think that that would be something that should be considered? Thank you for your question, Kelly. Yes, absolutely. Um, in Scotland, the licensing objective does apply to the over provision in any given area. So it absolutely deals with issues around alcohol outlet density. And, and we know from some um, some early work we did we did a few years ago when, when we commenced a piece of work um, looking at this, that alcohol outlet density um, is, is a particular concern and does um, does in fact um, add to alcohol related harms. So yes, the public health objective does um, essentially deal with that particular issue of over provision. In England and Wales, they have a slightly different system. They don't have a public health objective. They have um, cumulative impact policies or sometimes referred to as cumulative impact areas where they examine literally as, as the name suggests the, the cumulative impact of having um, the, the total number of off and on licenses in in, in, a, in any given area and i think there was quite some quite uh, quite significant project the the chalice study was conducted in in wales i think it's, it's about five years ago perhaps from that um study was published now but i'd certainly be happy to to send that on to the committee after today's session for your information that would be very helpful if I could just follow up there on what Joanna has said, um, one of the concerns is in um, less socially advantaged areas is that you may get a number of, you know, licensed off, off license and on license premises coming together. What happens then is they start competing with each other on price. Um, we will, you will then start to see co-location of betting shops um, and other um, outlets and um, that can create its own difficulties as well um, and they can become centres in terms of street drinking and so on which is probably the opposite of what we would like to see happening in terms of the urban regeneration and you know social development of disadvantaged communities so that's the sort of broader perspective that I think needs to be taken into account there's there's two aspects there's, there's a temporal availability in terms of when is alcohol available for sale by the time of day or night or morning and then the geographic availability of how many outlets are there and what happens when you get a lot of outlets together um, is that uh, it can create uh, areas Areas which become essentially no-go areas for the rest of the community. People don't feel comfortable, they feel intimidated, there's street drinking, there's crime, there's so on and so on. And that, again, is not what we want to be, not what any strategy would be looking for in terms of social development of disadvantaged communities. So I think that both the temporal availability by time, but also the the, the area of out, the, the the outlet density or the geographic, geographic availability are both you know salient concerns. I'm just um, thinking further on that, oh my goodness, it takes me back to my days as a student in the Lonely Hearts Club that used to be Spuds, Jasper, where exactly what you described. Um, everybody emptied out to get something to eat. Um, and, mm -hmm. and to be honest, I dread how any taxi driver could pass that area. But I'm just actually thinking of that. If we, in this um, proposal or in the draft legislation, the extension of ours, and drinking time just means that there will be that congregation in um, especially areas where there are a number of bars and, and pubs. It'll just be moved back a period of time. The police, when they gave us um, their presentation, had talked about the late night levy that's used elsewhere. Are you aware from a public health perspective if that late night levy is used to, help to fund the pressures on health service? Um, resulting from that gathering of people at end of night, the, obviously the public disturbance, I'm just thinking of, of your list there, the crime mm -hmm. and the public safety. Um, I know it's not used very often, but where it is used, is that public levering in part paying for health pressures? Yeah, I suppose, you know, in, in principle, I would probably say prevention is better than cure in terms of... <laughs> 
you know, uh, trying to prevent the problems, those problems happening. But I do appreciate that they, they have a substantial cost to the health and social service, including the, the police service, uh, public transport and so on. And there's a, there is a number and the, our frontline workers who have been uh, really so important to us during the pandemic are also the people who will be dealing, the ambulance drivers, the police and the A&E staff who may be dealing with any increase in alcohol-related um, harms in the acute setting of, of, of um, late night or early morning. Um, so uh, in general, uh, my comment that would be prevention is better, than, better than, than cure. However, yes, late night levies have been used. I think, they're a, I think they are a good idea. Uh, I believe there's a particularly good example in Newcastle-upon-Tyne where, they've, where they have um, operated a late night levy um, and that has included uh, funding for um, police, fire service, uh, health and social care, ambulance and so on, but also a medical pop-up facility in high drinking areas and also uh, has facilitated the involvement of NGOs who have an interest in getting involved. So say, for example, what you may see when people are intoxicated is you may see issues of increased risk of sexual assault. You may see increased risks of uh, mental health crisis. Uh, if there's been a relationship breakup or an argument, you may see increased risks of um, you know, um, violent assault and so on. So NGOs working in that space recognize that they do have a, that they can have a role in, in, in addressing those. And I suppose, you know, the, uh, I think in mental health, uh, when we think about mental health, sometimes we miss the impact of alcohol and mental health. It is strongly associated with the risk of, of suicide. Uh, for people who are alcohol dependent or have a problematic relationship with alcohol, but also for, in general, younger men who are intoxicated, who become impulsive and take an action that they otherwise would not have taken. Um, and that's a very, very difficult situation. And I think we need to we need to think about the role that acute intoxication plays, as well as people who are having a longer term problematic relationship with alcohol. And this will be relevant to the new mental health strategy and so forth. I'm just thinking in particular of um, the difficulties we will have with our budget going forward. Um, there's certainly, as we all know, plenty of NGOs out there like the SOS bus or the Street Angels um, mm -hmm. who provide an amazing service, but without funding um, mm -hmm. it could be problematic to deliver those services. So late night levy, if that provides an income. Um, do you know if there's been any kickback from the commercial providers um, or the people who hold the licenses in any other area to the late night levy or have they just accepted that as part of the the way to protect their customers especially after after you know that those very late night hours uh i don't know the answer to that i uh, i do know that additional trading hours are profitable um for the licensed sector and i think we shouldn't pretend that they're not um so I don't know whether the the scale of what they need to provide towards a late night levy is significant compared to the profits they make with the additional errors. I don't know the I don't know the maths and the economic on that. Um, I don't know, Joanna. Do you have any anything to add on that? We could certainly look into it for you. Yeah, no, just, just to say there has been no formal evaluation of late night levies. Um, there has been, as I understand it, good uptake in the London boroughs for, for obvious reasons, obviously um, city centre locations. We do know it's working well in Newcastle upon Tyne. Um, and um, sorry, there was another another thought there, but it has just, just escaped me um, when I was going to comment about the, the levies. Um, I know certainly that um, around thirty percent, around seventy percent, um, goes towards policing, and the other the other thirty percent um, is kind of managed by by local authorities, and they then can distribute that in, in terms of the um, health and, and social care costs. Sorry, the, the point that that has come to my mind is that one of the um, I suppose one of the points around late night levies that has emerged is kind of the, the geographic. Um, spread or, or kind of the geographic area with it within which they're applied so if it, if uh, a licensed premises stays open between midnight and 6 a.m that would um that would apply to all to all of those licensed premises in that um local local council district as i understand it um regardless of the harms that might um, result um, from customers exiting um, any particular so smaller establishments um, may not be 
um, experiencing the same level of harms or violence or assaults or things like that are resulting. So there has been some um, challenge, I think, from some proprietors, um, you know, in terms of kind of the the geographic spread. And I think if, if something like a late night levy was to be introduced in Northern Ireland, um, it would be worth having conversations, you know, with those in the, the Newcastle upon Tyne area to find out just a little bit more about the actual workings of it and, and sort of the practicalities and rollout. Thank you very much. That's all my questions. Very, very um, uh, detailed response that you've provided for us. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I don't see any other member who has raised their hand to ask a question. So can I just then thank you, Helen and Joanna, for joining us today. And thank you for a very, very informative briefing. So thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, members, we're going to then move on to agenda item four, which is a briefing from the GAA on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Members, you'll find the papers for this agenda item at page 182 of your meeting pack. Um, can I then welcome to the meeting Brian McAvoy, Dermot Marsden, and Stephen McGain. Um, okay, there's a, three of you are very, very welcome here today. Um, I think it's Brian, I think it's yourself that is going to open up um, with a few remarks. You've got up to 10 minutes to make your remarks, followed by um, questions. Yeah. I can hear you okay. Is that Brian speaking? Yeah, uh, there seems to be a bit of buffering at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I don't know if you can see me or not, can you? We can't see you, Brian, but we can certainly hear you, so we can. You hear me? Well, do you want to proceed, Chair, on that basis? Yeah, or that's fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, happy enough. Apologies, I know what's happening. Just to... You're okay. We, we, we have glitches every week in this committee, so we, it's no shock to us at all. But go ahead. Fine. Well, I mean, I'm here. I, I can assure you I'm here. <laughs> okay, uh, Chair. Uh, first of all, uh, just at the outset, may I thank uh, you and the members of the Committee for Communities uh, for providing us to Jay with the opportunity to uh, present our oral evidence to you in relation to this uh, license and registration of clubs and men bill as it progresses through the, the assembly. Uh, as I said, as you said, my name is Brian McAvoy, Chief Executive Officer and Provincial Secretary of Ulster GA. And I'm joined here this morning uh, by senior staff members Jim Martin and Stephen McGeehan. The GA is the world's largest amateur sporting community and cultural organization. Uh, the the Council of the GA is the provincial council and governing body uh, for the GA in Ulster. Uh, it covers two political jurisdictions uh, and we oversee the work of nine county committees across those uh, political jurisdictions and 373 clubs, as well as GA activity in over 1,500 schools and colleges. And we have some, uh, some uh, quarter of a million volunteer members who are actively involved in the GA at all levels uh, in Ulster. Uh, in the north, we have 261 GA clubs, of which over 80 have a license to sell alcohol and are registered uh, as a social club. Uh, many of these clubs are also registered uh, within the Federation of Clubs, uh, NI, that I think you heard from uh, a number of weeks ago. Uh, it, it is uh, in these environments that the GA members can enjoy um, licensed premise responsibility as they uh, responsibly as they discuss recent games and activities. Uh, many of our clubs uh, show major games on televisions and large screens, and this provides an opportunity for members to watch those games uh, in, in, a, in a social setting. The, we are a community organisation. Our GA clubs are at the heart of those communities, and having a social club can provide a, a valuable outlet, and particularly maybe to many of our, our, our older members. Uh, having a social club is a benefit for clubs organising fundraising events and it can also be a, a method to generate income through bar sales and various entertainment initiatives. Uh, some of our clubs provide employment opportunities as they are operated by either full-time or part-time bar staff and while others are looked after by volunteer members. The GA is acutely aware of its responsibilities around uh, responsible alcohol consumption and we are aware of the dangers of alcohol addiction and dependency. Uh, we're very proactive in addressing the health and well-being of our members. Uh, a health and a formal health and well-being structure is in place uh, at national level, at provincial level, and at county level, 
uh, on each of those organisations or each of those uh, units have uh, county health and wellbeing committees in place. And then at grassroots level, at club level, there's a healthy club programme and each club is required to have a healthy club officer. And the remit of that person is the promotion of key health messages uh, to, to its members. Um, the health and wellbeing structures in place, we off, offer educational advice to both youth and adult members and to players. Some clubs uh, use services of external agencies as well, and statutory bodies also to deliver key messages on alcohol and substance abuse to various groups, and all clubs are asked to adopt and adhere to uh, a GA uh, tobacco, alcohol and drugs policy. We also place great emphasis on safeguarding of children, and we have in place a code of behaviour on their age, which outlines best practice in dealing with, uh, with, with those underage members. And this includes the protection of our children, not only within all areas of the PA club and its facilities, but beyond that as well, to and from matches, that sort of thing. Uh, while, while our majority of uh, affiliated clubs do not have a social club, as I say, we have 80 in total just uh, across the province, uh, but those that do, there is a general agreement uh, with proposals contained within this bill. The GA clubs want to do things correctly, and the overall feeling uh, is that the measures in this bill uh, will support their efforts in doing just that. Uh, while not all of the measures proposed in the bill are relevant to our social clubs, many of them are, and in particular we'd like to highlight just a small number of the proposals in the bill, uh, which are uh, based on a, a survey of our clubs, would be broadly welcomed. And these include uh, authorization for a sporting club to extend the area of its premises, which is registered, registered to supply alcohol for the purpose of holding a function uh, on an uh, occasion up to six times per year. Uh, number of late night opening uh, nights increased uh, to either two or three nights per week. I think we probably favour the, the, the uh, formal one, the two per week. Uh, the easement of the current advertising restrictions on clubs. Uh, the underage functions permitted to take place in specified uh, areas of club premises. Um, young people to be permitted to remain on licensed premises at private functions, provided certain conditions are met. Uh, underage prize giving uh, permitted on club premises to allow a, 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 a juvenile to be uh, able to attend any three of those per year from the current one. And for, for young people under 18 to be permitted in the bar area of the sporting club uh, until 11 p.m. during specified months. And we think it will be particularly beneficial during the months of May to September when the, the club season um, is in full swing and there will be games uh, in evening time, maybe particularly on Friday nights or, or Saturday evenings, that sort of thing. So uh, those are our main observations from the bill. Uh, and thank you for again for giving us the opportunity to present you this morning. Okay, Brian, look, thank you very much for that. And Brian, I've just got a few questions. Um, can I ask members to raise their hands if they want to come in and ask anything? Um, I'm interested in your, your alcohol, drugs, and tobacco policy. Just if you go into a bit more detail, uh, and I think that I think it was Sinead and our committee had mentioned in, a, in a, an earlier briefing that we had had about the um, the advertising in, in, in GAA grounds. Um, just if you can just give us a wee bit more information on those. Uh, absolutely, Chair. Um, I'll even broaden it out beyond that. I mean, the GAA ha ha has a very responsible, uh, as I said in, in the presentation, approach to, to advertising. Uh, not only in relation to grounds, but also in relation to playing gear. Uh, so, for example, on, on playing gear, we, you know, we do not allow um, uh, an alcohol company or a public house or an off license uh, to to be on 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 an underage jersey. We do not allow any uh, team sponsorship uh, for underage teams. Uh, what it is in relation to, to grounds. Um, it's really something that we have been phasing out uh, over, over over the last number of years. Uh, you will still see some maybe for a local pub, that sort of thing, yeah. But it's not something we we, we promote as an organisation in terms of, of uh, actively seeking uh, sponsorship from alcohol companies for grounds. And of course, you know, one very good example of that uh, is in relation just to our national competitions. You will recall uh, that. Uh, 
a well-known uh, drinks company, Guinness, uh, were sponsor of the All Ireland Hurling Championship uh, from the mid uh, '90s to the mid '90s, uh, and then they were part. They were excluded. They were they were the title sponsor during during that decade or so, and then between 2005 and 2013. Uh, they were part of a, a three-party multi sponsor, and from 2013, you know, they haven't been part of any sponsorship. And the, the GA does not um, ha, ha nationally have any sponsorship for any drinks company uh, for, for any of our competitions nationally. No, and I, I do. I, I, I thank you for answering that, Brent. Brand, and absolutely um, should be commended um, for the work that you are doing. Um, in the relation to that, we have had several witness sessions here where, um, where we've heard from you know sort of that public health side um, about the advertising and how now, not that it, I think it falls within this bill the advertising, but it's good to see that you know such a large sport across Ireland is taking this this issue very seriously uh, and encouraging. You'd mentioned underage teams. I take it then the over 18s teams do they still have? Some sort of advertising on their jerseys, or are you looking to phase that out as well? You might just see it maybe like a, like a local bar and restaurant, but no, that's been virtually phased out. We don't have it. Uh, you know, it, it's not common. Uh, I'm not aware of, of, of any uh, county or indeed club that, that currently has a, a sponsorship of, of an alcohol company uh, on their jersey. No, no, uh, no. It's, some, it's something that you know we don't actively seek anymore. No, that's good. Well done. I um, just want to ask you just around one of the clauses then on the bill, and it was in relation to um, the advertising restrictions around clause 31. Um, just to ask you, um, just what impact would that have on your clubs? Um, thanks, Chair. I think in, in relation to this, um, and maybe Jim and Stephen might want to come in on the back of it. Um, our specific um, rationale for welcoming the rela proposed relaxation of this is based on our community-based uh, ethos. Many of the functions, the vast majority of functions in GA social club, the table quizzes or fighting shows or whatever, are for a charitable purpose. And the current uh, restrictions, which do not allow that to be advertised, the relaxation of that. Uh, would be of extremely benefit to the charitable uh, functions that, that GA community up and down the country support. So that is our primary motivation uh, in the uh, in welcoming the relaxation uh, as proposed in this bill. So, Jim, do you want to come in on this? Hmm. No, just to agree with what Brian has, has said there, it's, it's really about um, maximizing any sort of event that a club may run and to utilize their, their club premises to do so. Some can be for club fundraising, some can be purely for a charitable purpose or some can be a mixture of both. I suppose it's getting the most exposure to do that so the, the relaxation of that restriction would, would be welcome in, those, in that regard. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I'm echoing, so I'm a bit. Thank you, Brian and Dermot, for, for those answers. I'm going to open up to members. I have Mark and then I have Kelly. So if we can go to bring Mark Durkin into the spotlight, please. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Steve, Brian, Dermot and, and Stephen for the presentation. I jotted down a couple of questions before you started, lads, but you kind of answered them. I see we're going along. And then uh, the, the, the Chair... Came, came in on advertising, which is what, what, what I, I, I'm a particular interest in. Now, I'd like to commend you, I suppose, in terms of your presentation, but also in terms of your organization's promotion of, of, of healthy uh, lifestyles. And I'm particularly interested in the, the concept or the practice of, of each club. You know, it filters down from the center and, and ultimately then each club has a healthy club officer. I was just wondering, could you maybe outline how that works in practical terms and how they engage with, with, with club members? And I don't expect every club to be doing it to the same standard, but is there a best practice that you can even point other clubs towards? Yeah, I'm happy to take it, but it's Jeremy's area of speciality. Do you want to come in first, Jeremy? Uh, and then I'll come back if there's anything I think needs to be added. Okay, um, thanks. And thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I suppose our structures uh, enable us to, to get those really good messages out to 
quite a range of, of a massive amount of members and young people um, through our National Health and Wellbeing Committee to our Provincial Health and Wellbeing Committee, right down to our, our nine county committees. And then at the local level, the, the most important thing is that it's a requirement now for each club to have a healthy club officer, as, as you have said. So each club has their own um, remit to do and promote good messages of, of health uh, in whatever way they see fit and whatever resources they have at their disposal. I suppose the guidance would come from those those structures. Uh, I can give an example of clubs that would bring in uh, external agencies and maybe secure funding to deliver those messages to a group of young people. I've seen uh, uh, evidence of, uh, particularly in these times when we can't meet up, of Zoom calls to, to young groups um, that talk about gambling and uh, alcohol uh, awareness and drug awareness uh, and things that are so, so important that uh, external agencies and statutory bodies recognise the reach that we have in doing that. Uh, our healthy club officers remit would be not just for young people but the entire membership and I've seen uh, examples of, of bringing older people in and, and running events for them during the week uh, to keep them engaged and, and to address those areas of, of social isolation. Uh, but the overall health and well-being of, of our membership is, 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 is so, so important. I suppose um, sporting performance and alcohol definitely do not mix. And it's that young age group, and I know they get it in school, but we would do our best at club level and for those elite players at, at county level to basically say that alcohol and drugs and sport just don't mix. Um, we also try and sort of steer away from using alcohol uh, when celebrating the victory, and you know, we're not permitted to have alcohol in cups or anything like that anymore. Um, so we, we do take it very seriously, and as I said, just to reiterate, to reiterate the point that um, organisations do see the reach that we have to get that message right across the board to a, a large scale of, of boys and girls and young men and young women. Uh, I'll give you one example, which we, which we haven't done in the last two and, and uh, it's linked to those young people moving to university. We had a drink, drugs and sausage rolls program our initiative, which was aimed at freshers leaving, leaving home for the first time and you know uh, providing awareness around, I suppose, how to look after themselves nutritionally, uh, the, the dangers of drugs and, and, and you know, alcohol uh, dependency or, or going mad on alcohol when, when they sever the ties from the parental home. So uh, these things that we, we do take seriously and we try and sort of, promote and, and, and as broad a range as possible. Now, I suppose that's become a, a lot more challenging, not will this one be exclusive to uh, the GAA, but uh, over the past year when you don't have the same structure in terms of young, young people reporting to training a couple of times a week or that, it, it, it's more difficult to keep track of and, or, and keep a lid on to this type of activity. I, I think it's particularly difficult and you have more experience in it than me, but when young ones start, they hit 16, 17, 18, and unless they're in a kind of reasonably successful sort of team, I think people tend to, to drift then, and, and I don't know if, if you have the formula yet or if you could bottle the formula for, for keeping that interest in, because like you say, participation in sport, be it uh, Gaelic, mm -hmm. football, hurling, Camogie or soccer, rugby or, or, or cricket or whatever, it isn't really conducive to tea drinking and, and, and what have you either, but it, it's just trying to, to keep to keep the young ones in, that, that's that's the tricky bit. Just uh, one other wee point that then I will raise, I don't think he touched on it there, but it was, you will have seen in the, in the bill that it would enable the department to vary permitted hours for an event it deems a major event. Now, we had we the evidence on how major events should be defined, but I, I don't really want to, be, to be go down the, the, the casement route today, but it's sadly, it seems we're still a wee bit away from having major events in, in, in casement, and hopefully we can, we can get there as soon as possible. But would you guys have any views on, on, my, on how a, a major event should be designed or, or designated with regard to your, your own sports? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question, Mark. Obviously, the, the, the 2016 legislation uh, did address this to, to some effect. Uh, Stephen, you're probably best placed to go into some of the minutiae uh, in relation to major events, given your work with placement. Uh, are you happy to 
the middle of the back of that. <clears throat> Happy to, Brian, Chair, members, if you can all hear me okay, yeah? Yep. Um, yes, um, it's a good question from Mark and, and clearly from the point of view of the Justice Bill that, that Brian referred to some time ago. It was in the era when ourselves and our colleagues in both IFA and the Ulster branch of, of rugby were setting out in our case for the first time and, and in their case, uh, thankfully for them, the only time um, to develop their major uh, regional facilities for both the, uh, the Windsor Park development and Kingspan Ravenhill. And um, the availability of alcohol and the, uh, the events uh, uh, environment around major sporting events has always been an ancillary uh, uh, part of what we do and um, we've seen that work very very successfully at both uh, Ravenhill and at Windsor and we'd be hopeful that hopefully in, in, in not too long into the future that this arrangement can apply at, at Casement Park at a new Casement Park. Uh, clearly from an events point of view um, in relation to what we saw for the Open hosted in Port Rush, the MTV Music Awards and the uh, references that have been made in the dra in the draft bill as well. It's very, very encouraging um, that government has taken a proactive attitude to, I suppose, identifying that major sports events or events of themselves are not just about what happens on the green pitch or in the arena. Um, it stretches much further than that. And, and, and colleagues and members in the committee may remember when the GA was proactively involved, for example, in the Irish uh, rugby bid for the 2023 Rugby World Cup and in recent days, we've heard about the, the joint uh, government bids and the home country FAs for the uh, FIFA World Cup of 2030. And of course, those events just don't happen in stadia. They happen in city centres, yeah. they happen in towns, and it, that's all very much a part of it. Um, and we've seen it with, with the tall ships. These are major events. And uh, if within Northern Ireland, we want to attract those uh, size and significance of events, I think mm -hmm. any amendment that allows on application, I note from your document uh, the Scottish model, um, which was proposed by the department, which was making a determination based on the national significance, as was described of the event. And certainly, from a, a GA point of view, we would uh, uh, we would support a responsible approach uh, in in that fashion, Mark. Okay, thank you, Stephen. That's grand. Is that you finished, Mark? Yeah, sorry, Chair. Cut off, I got cut off there a wee bit. But no, that's fine. Thank you, lads. Thanks. Okay. okay. Thanks, Mark. Um, can we bring Kelly into the spotlight, please? Thank you very much, Chair, and um, thank you very much, Brian, Dermot, and Stephen. Um, the Chair has already mentioned about advertising restrictions, and, and as has Mark, so I'll not mention those. Um, can I just start off by saying thank you very much for the work that um, the whole GA has done during COVID. Um, I live in Ballygalgate, and um, as you can appreciate, it's a very tight-knit community, um, and if it wasn't for phone calls to my dad talking about his hurling days, I would have had to put up with him, so thank you very much. Um, what I would like to ask you about is the last comment that you have on your document you've provided to us. Young people are to be permitted in the area of I had had concerns regarding this and I brought it up a few times in different witness sessions because, as we know, the season lasts for much longer. Um, than just the summer months, um, and and it's the and this doesn't just apply to GAA. It's across any of the the clubs and and different um, sporting networks that that have bars in the, in their premises. So we will have awards nights. Um, we will have times when young people are deliberately in in premises with perhaps older members of the community. Um, we have Christmas time, we have different things like that that comes up. Um, and I noticed there you're saying that you would like to coincide, young people to be able to be in um, up to 11 o'clock to coincide with the main GA club playing season. But a lot of your premises would be um, embedded within communities, as certainly Ballygallig, Ballycrown and Portofray in my area would be. I'm just wondering, um, there is a proposal within the legislation or the proposed legislation um, for a certain once a year outside of whatever the defined period of time is for young people to be able to be in a bar. Is that enough? Is that enough to be workable for that community connection? And it's not just yourselves, of course, that could be rugby or football, it could be golf, it could be anything at all. Um, I'm just thinking, are we being too restrictive or is it too restrictive? Do you think it is or... Um, is it enough that's currently being proposed? 
Um, thanks, Kelly. A very, very good question. I mean, we, we thought about this, and we, we you know, we, we we surveyed our club in relation to this. I think I think the key in this is being a family organisation. Uh, people go, you know, families go together. Now, the reason we, we, we've highlighted those summer months is that there are maybe evening games, particularly maybe on a Friday or a Saturday evening or a Sunday evening potentially, right? So you've been going as a family. If there was no event, no game happening, the family's not going to be going to a training session. So we felt that it, it's almost because they're there and you know the parent may want to go in for a drink after the match those games probably aren't going to be finished until quarter past half past nine uh, particularly during during the months of may and june so we welcome the extension to 11 o'clock but no i think our primary focus was because the family would be there rather than nothing happening and bringing them there on a different night or a different occasion so that's why we particularly focused on on, on those summer months Okay. Um, and what about the awards that happen outside of that period of time? Because I know locally for ourselves here, in order to keep young people interested and engaged throughout the whole year, there may well be other events that happen that would, as not necessarily up as far as 11 o'clock for primary school youngsters, but um, yeah. for young ones to be there half nine, 10 o'clock maybe. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Just keep it as it's proposed or you know, look for more times during the year that that could be applied for? Well, we welcome the, the opportunity uh, for the juvenile to be allowed to be there for three because, you know, as you know, uh, you come, you know, particularly a rural club like, like Ballygalgate, you know, if a, a player can be playing on the 13 and on the 15, um, you know, uh, so we, we do welcome the opportunity. But of course, on those juvenile specific functions, uh, the bar wouldn't be open. Um, you know, so, 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 so you know, we'd be very, very clear about that. Now, if there is a, a different uh, function or different award, right, like a club dinner or something, there may be an occasion for, for, a, for a juvenile to be there. It, it, it wouldn't be common now, to be honest, you know, most functions now, they wouldn't t- tend to be juveniles, at the, juveniles at the, but there are occasions, but I think they would be covered under, under the potentially some of the other bits of the legislation in relation to, you know, the the, the, the late open or whatever. I think our key thing is that where a bar is open in any occasion and a, and a juvenile is on the premises, you know, they've got to be accompanied by an adult and they must be properly supervised at all times. You know, I think that that's our key uh, on overriding thing. Or if there is a, a juvenile event going on, um, you know, the bar shouldn't be open uh, in, in, in that particular part of the premises where, where that is going on. Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. So the main one at this stage then would be that the the summer months should be May from the start of May to the end of September, and and that would help because at the minute it's it's too restrictive, isn't it? Yeah, I mean the, the reason, as I say, just it, that coincides with the evening games. Uh, you know, you, um, you're not going to have well, you know, not every club has floodlights. Uh, you're not going to have evening games all year round. You know, but those are the games where during the summer months. Uh, where, uh, where where games are played in the evenings, and that's the the the, the, uh, the rationale behind those months that we put forward. Yeah, it is restrictive at the moment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that to be honest, because um, the issue about sponsor about the the alcohol, the advertising has already been dealt with. Um, yeah. That's that's my main one. It's just about I just know from my local experience that <clears throat> the clubhouse is more than just. You know, a bar. It's it's somewhere where you can get access to toilets. It's not obviously the changing rooms, but children are about it. They're they're used to meeting up with you know the community there. Um, it is very much a community space, and alcohol isn't the main priority yeah. there. Um, and I mean, in fairness, you yeah. know, is, is one club you know in a rural area where you could point to. You know, as you say, the bar well run. The new hub that they opened there a year or two ago. Um, you know, absolutely excellent. You know, it is a model GA club in that respect. Yeah. Yeah, don't talk to me every time I go past it. I should be on their walking track. It's flood lit up just to point at me and say, Kelly, get out on. But no, thank you very much, folks. Um, I'm sure I'll speak to you at the sports forum soon, but um, that's very useful. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you, Kelly. I don't have any other member who has um, raised their hand to ask any further questions. Um, so can I then just thank you, Brian, Dermot and Stephen. Um, for taking time today to come and brief the committee and also for, for um, letting us know just what you are doing um, as an organisation um, when it comes to, to alcohol um, and, and looking after our young people. 
So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, members, we are going to move then on to agenda item five, which is our last briefing on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill, and it's a briefing from Drink Aware. Um, members, you'll find this agenda item in your tabled papers. And can I welcome to the meeting Elaine Hindle? Um, Elaine, you're very welcome. Is Elaine there? Has she come into the spotlight? Or am I talking to myself? Bear with me. With an Adam. Adam, are you here to speak to us? I am here, yes. yes uh, the lady is in the process of joining, so hopefully you will be with us shortly. That's not a problem, Adam. Not a bother. If you want to go ahead then and um, brief the committee. Um, I know that, uh, because I'd spoken to you previously and I'd asked that maybe it would be a good idea for the committee to hear your presentation. It's maybe not um, directly linked to all of our clauses in the bill, but it certainly gives a bit of us a bit of an overview um, on, on the levels of alcohol consumption. Um, so uh, there's Elaine has now joined us. Elaine, you're very welcome as well. So then can I hand over to yourselves and ask you just to, you've got up to 10 minutes to brief the committee if you want to go ahead. Great. I believe Elaine is here. So Elaine will just um, start and give a little bit of background to Drink Aware, and then I will pick up and, and talk through some areas of particular note. Okay, Elaine. Elaine, can you hear us? I, I don't believe she can, actually. Okay. Just looking. This is all perfectly normal, so yeah, we have tech technical difficulties constantly. Oh, this sounds like someone's doing their hoover in there. Um, Elaine, Elaine, can you hear us now? No, I don't think she can. Um, Adam, do you want to actually, if you can even text Elaine and just say if she wants to come out and try and rejoin us again? Absolutely. Um, so I can kick off, and um, Elaine can always join in. Um, if, if she's able to get the audio working. It's, we're being told it's at, it's at Elaine's end, it's not at our end. So if you can, if, if you want to just take a, a moment to send her a quick text and ask her would she um, go out and then come back in again. Okay, um, let me just do that. That's okay. Okay. Yeah, so um, I've just communicated that to Elaine, so I think she'll probably come out and then come back in. That's grand. If you want to go ahead, Adam, that's grand. Okay. Oh, oh there's Elaine I'll back proceed. with us again. Hold on, sorry. Elaine, can you hear us now? Broadcaster saying just to get her to check her audio and video settings, but if she can't hear us, she's not. No, if, going, yeah, if she can't hear us, to say, will you check your, your settings? I don't you? know if you can hear me, but I cannot hear any sound at all. I do apologise if you can hear me. I cannot hear anything from the um, committee room. My apologies. Okay. Adam. I'm, I'm talking to Elaine in the background, actually, and I'll, I'll ask her to start. And if she's not able to, then um, I'll pick it up and pick up Elaine's part as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Adam. Shall I just begin? Yes. Okay, I'm getting in. yes. Sorry. Um, I'll begin. Uh, first of all, thank you to the committee for the opportunity to speak to you about alcohol harm in Northern Ireland. Um, we are going to keep our presentation uh, brief and forgive me, hopefully by the time we have questions I might be able to get some sound. Um, briefly to introduce Drinkware, we are a UK-wide charity. We're unusual in that we are funded solely by contributions from alcohol producers, retailers, that's all and off trade, so including the hospitality sector and some other sports bodies, for example, in a small amount of commercial income. But Drinkware was set up in 2006 
in response to a request by government at the time for the industry to do more to educate people about the harms of alcohol. So we are a charity, we're governed solely by a board of trustees and chaired by Sir Lee Lewis, former permanent secretary of the Department of Work and Pensions, and I answer solely to the board as its chief executive. In terms of the information that we put out to the, the public, intent to do two things, to educate people about the harms of alcohol, and secondly, to help people who need to change harmful drinking habits on that journey towards making a change signposting them to some sort of health and support, but also directly with innovations like, for example, online self-assessments or apps on phones to help people who can and are able to make that change without further intervention to do so before their alcohol use gets worse. So that's primarily our, our, our purpose. Um, so although we're funded by the industry, we are fiercely independent of the industry and we, um, uh, our, our opportunity, our remit, is entirely independent of the industry. It's also worth adding that everything that we do is uh, vetted, if you like, and goes through an independent that's chaired by Dr. Fiona Sim, formerly chair of the Royal Faculty of Public Health. And everything that we do is, is, uh, is evidence-based and vetted by, by them particularly, of course, in relation to the health information that, that, we, that we share. Uh, Adam and I are very aware that, of course, you've had a comprehensive briefing note, I think, to the committee last September from Dr. Raymond Russell that provided very valuable context to uh, alcohol-related hospital admissions in Northern Ireland and rates of harm in Northern Ireland. So we're not going to focus on those uh, today. We're really trying to give you a sense of what has happened during the pandemic in very recent data to give the committee a sense of, of the very current issues that Northern Ireland is facing in terms of harmful drinking. Our research is, is, is drawn from three sources. The first is our Drink Our Own Monitor. This is an annual, very large survey, more than 9,000 adults in the UK, more than 600 adults in Northern Ireland, a statistically significant sample of drinkers uh, in Northern Ireland to get a sense of, of how their drinking has changed. That was fielded in September of last year, so it's very current data about drinking habits, and more importantly, the reasons why those drinking habits are changing. We also ran um, three what we've called pulse surveys during the course of last year in May, July and December to really get a sense of what's happening right now because things are changing so quickly. We really wanted to, uh, to, to get a sense of, of more rapid uh, feedback. And of course, the most rapid feedback of all is data from our website and from our app in terms of data-driven insights as to how behaviours are changing. And we're providing this briefing to the committee. Obviously, uh, I hope to, to give you some valuable information as to the wider picture of harmful drinking, the context in which you are considering uh, the licensing regulations in Northern Ireland. As an organisation, Drinkware is not a, uh, an advocacy organization we do not have a policy remit but we are required under our memorandum of understanding the government to make our available information available to you in order to, uh, to, to for that context to be provided it's worth also saying what we mean by harmful drinking in this context um, the chief medical officer's guidance as, as you will all be fully aware is that men and women drink no more than 14 units a week we use that as our guide. Beyond that is what we consider harmful. Um, but also we use the audit C tool, the alcohol use disorders identification test. It's a WHO tool. It's actually available on our website. So we have hundreds of thousands of people complete it every year, which gives us some very rich insight as to uh, dependency across, across a very large population. And we talk about, and we will talk about in this presentation, increasing and higher risk drinkers. And that's what we mean, people who score highly on their alcohol use disorders test, uh, which is, is the inverse. 
Before I hand over to Adam to talk about groups of key concern for us, I'd just like to summarise the key findings that we have found in Northern Ireland as in the UK. And it's worth saying that there are some differences. By and large, the pattern of harmful drinking in Northern Ireland mirrors that of the UK as a whole, with a couple of key differences. The first is that Northern Ireland tends to have a slightly higher proportion of people who don't drink at all. So we see that uh, we've seen that consistently for a number of years in drink aware monitored data, and you tend to have a slightly higher proportion of people who say they drink very little, if at all. Secondly, then we also see that daily drinking or very frequent drinking is a little less in Northern Ireland than it is in the UK as a whole. However, some of this data suggests that pattern is changing, and obviously a, a key concern for us is people who are drinking at harmful levels, but who are drinking every day and never uh, never take a break and that habitual drinking behavior is a key concern. Um, so just to summarize the key findings from, from our insights that are relevant, we think, to Northern Ireland. And we're just going to summarize those in, in, as three key points. The first, is that drinking habits appear to be polarizing. So what we're seeing is about a third of people in May and June claim to be drinking more than usual. A similar proportion, about a quarter actually, so a little bit less, claim to have been drinking less than normal, despite the closure of course of the hospitality sector. By August and September, that proportion drinking more had reduced. Uh, in, you know, we, we welcome that, uh, but we're still seeing 14% of people saying even by then they were drinking more than usual, indicating that for some, habits being formed at the beginning of the pandemic were long-lasting. Our second point is that there are some groups of key concern that if we simply look at at the sort of overall global population level would be masked. Um, and Adam's going to take us through those in just a moment. But they are, first of all, people who were already drinking at harmful levels and have been doing for some time. Their health is already compromised, particularly important at this time. Um, and we know that lifestyle behaviors, um, alcohol drinking uh, as a behavior, tends to coexist with other risky um, lifestyle behaviors as well, smoking, being overweight, having low levels of physical activity, having poor diet. So we're particularly concerned about those harmful drinkers who are drinking more through the pandemic and were already um, putting their health at risk. The second group we'll talk about are parents of children under 18, and particularly mothers and women. Um, We've seen that they are under particular amounts of stress uh, through through the last 12 months, of, of course, um, and we're seeing that they are also reporting higher levels of drinking to cope. The third group is a relatively small group because of the relatively protective effect of furlough in the short term, but it's people who are either have been made redundant or who are going through a redundancy process with their employer, more so than furloughed workers, but we are concerned about people who are uh, redundant and who are drinking again to cope with uncertainty, anxiety, and stress. And then that relates us to our fourth group of particular concern, people who've reported that they are uh, to a large extent or to a very large extent negatively impacted by the pandemic and particularly in relation to their mental health. Now there are overlaps between these groups, some people will fall into, uh, into to, to two or three of those groups, but a significant proportion of the population, about a third, um, are really negatively impacted. And as I've said, the third finding is that we're seeing those harmful drinking habits uh, having formed over a sustained period of time may be maintained even as we um, cautiously uh, move towards a lessening of restrictions, but that those harmful drinking habits coexist with other um, unhealthy 
lifestyle behaviors and choices uh, that particularly in, in, in the pandemic as we have to learn to live with COVID-19 uh, have very serious implications indeed for our physical and mental health. So I'm going to hand over to Adam, I'll try to fix my sound in the meantime, to talk a little bit more about each of those four groups. Okay, thank, you, Adam. thank you, Elaine. So just to pick up on some of the points that Elaine has raised there, and then we have, of course, provided a paper to the committee, and this breaks down a lot of this information in much more depth um, in terms of what the overall trends for consumption within Northern Ireland were last year, um, as uh, identified through our various pieces of research that Elaine has summarised. Um, and it also gives uh, perhaps a bit more detail as to what some of um, individual groups are, um, which I'll touch on in a minute, that we are particularly um, concerned about or we feel are potentially ones to watch. But it also talks about the motivations, so the reasons why people are potentially consuming more than they have previously. Um, I think it's important to state, and Elaine has said this, it is very much at top level a mixed bag. So there has been a significant portion of people, and I'll come on to some of those groups in a minute, who have consumed more, um, some in early stage of lockdown and then fell back, some throughout lockdown. Uh, in terms of percentage-wise, the majority actually have maintained fairly consistent levels as pre-pandemic. And there has actually been um, around that quarter mark who have consumed less. So it very much is a mixed picture. We, of course, are by nature more concerned with those that have drunk more. And within that category, um, there are four groups, which Elaine has touched on, that we feel it's worth giving particular note to. And also uh, in terms of really keeping an eye on how those patterns of consumption whether they continue or not, or whether they fall back. The first of those groups is high-risk drinkers. And as Elaine indicated, we use the Audit C as um, our means of assessing the, uh, the level of consumption and dependency uh, of individuals. Um, Drinkware is responsible for providing information, tools, advice, um, and key medical facts to the whole population, but we, by nature, disproportionately focus on this group. And high-risk drinkers have been well represented in those that have consumed more at all stages of the pandemic. So um, some individuals drunk more early on and actually dropped back later on. High-risk drinkers have been fairly well represented in terms of continuing a higher level of consumption. And of course, these are groups that were drinking more by and large in the first instance. So they do remain um, a cause of concern for us. In terms of their motivations, um, it's things like having more time on their hands. It's things like boredom, but inevitably there is also the drinking to cope, as we call it, so that element of stress. Um, this group, and we do find this, they, they know they need to cut down and they identify that. I think the challenge is actually turning that knowledge and intent into action. And that's really where we try and focus our efforts um, in terms of the support that we provide through Drink Aware. The second group, as Elaine identified, was parents of young children or, or children um, perhaps who are still at school and educational age. Now, this has actually been fairly evenly split in terms of male-female, I think about 55% female, but actually it tends to be half of females who have sole caring responsibilities um, as opposed to just 12% of men. And what we found here is that this is the, one of the biggest parts of the population that has been well represented in increasing their consumption, um, around 23%. Uh, and again, we're finding here that there is um, this group is reporting impacts on mental health, and it's effectively as people are trying to balance the challenges of homeschooling um, and of the impacts of the pandemic and work. Quite often, it's um, people who are in work also trying to homeschool, and we see that again that the stress that this has bring has for some resulted in increased levels of consumption. The third group that we identified um, is about those that have either been made redundant or are in the process of redundancy. Now, this is only about 
of the population at present. But I think it is quite likely that that will rise, and therefore it's a cause of concern looking forward. Um, they're by and large almost twice as likely as the general population to be drinking more. Um, and again, and this is a consistent theme, and I think something for the committee to consider, um, again, reporting the impacts on mental health. Um, so on areas like anxiety, on stress, on depression, um, on issues with sleep as well. So there's very much a knock-on effect from all of these factors. We are seeing this group reporting as um, being amongst those who have increased their consumption over the last year. Just finally, the final group to talk through is uh, those identified as having been uh, largely affected or um, very largely affected by the pandemic um, in their daily lives, in their circumstance. Uh, and actually, we've seen this group well represented again in those that have consumed more throughout the pandemic. And, Perhaps not surprisingly, but one of the biggest motivations for this group is um, what we term as drinking to cope. So effectively leaning on alcohol to help cope with some of the challenges that they are experiencing, and particularly across the pandemic. Um, interestingly, that it can quite, quite often be female, um, more so than male, and it's around the younger age category, the 18 to 44 age category. Um, I think probably the messages to leave the committee with is, is as Elaine said, it's, it's very much um, a polarisation of how the population has responded in terms of alcohol to the pandemic. Um, some have drunk less, um, the majority consistent, but there are groups um, that have more, and that indeed is where we continue to focus efforts. That's probably the first piece. The second piece, a lot of those groups who have been more effective, uh, the impacts and implications of mental health um, are consistently being reported as, um, as something that is a cause for concern. And again, this is something that we will continue to focus on, um, and I'm sure the committee um, give consideration to as well. Uh, so that brings us to the end of the briefing, but we are, of course, happy to take questions. Okay, thank you, Adam, and thank you, Elaine. I don't know, Elaine, if you can hear us or not yet? Yes, you can. Yes, okay. I can now. Thank you. Great. 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 Um, look, thank you for your briefing. Um, I suppose um, I know it, uh, you, you didn't respond to our, our consultation and um, you haven't talked about any of our clauses, but I felt um, it was important that the committee heard from you as well. Um, we have a great responsibility uh, in, in shaping this bill also. And I think it is interesting to learn because it was whenever I'd first spoken to yourself, Adam, it was interesting to know that actually that you were there gathering this data um, across all of the UK um, and, and how this how you how you were actually funded as well um, through um, through the, those alcohol producers. So it was good to get that and, and how you're also autonomous in all of this. Um, to that, that was good. I suppose I just want to ask you a couple of questions that actually are relating to our bill. Um, it's to do with that whole wider uh, public health implications. And we had heard earlier from Public Health Ireland, and we'd also heard last week from the University of Stirling, um, that we should be putting something within the bill um, that actually uh, that, that, that takes this seriously in the whole public health and, and have that legislated for. Would you be in agreement with that also? Would you like me to answer that one? Um, I think for us, as an organisation that doesn't have a, a sort of policy remit, I can say that we can't speak from a position of evidence on this. Um, however, in the current pandemic, to be considering public health in the context of this would be something we would absolutely you know, expect you to be doing and, 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 and fully support. I suppose then, just to follow on, and I know that you, as you say, you don't have a policy remit, and um, so mm. you can't give opinion on some of the stuff. But I just asking you: Have you done any work, or is there any evidence you have had to do with under 18s as well? Um, because our bill is proposing to open up um, the, where, where younger people can remain longer on, on licensed premises and things like that. Have you done any um, work around uh, the impact of younger people who are? Um, have have access to those premises um, and seeing alcohol consumption, any impact that has on them later in life? That's a really good question, actually. 
At the top of my head, I don't believe we have, but that's something that we will double check and come back to the committee on. What we do know about underage drinking is that children who drink underage are much more likely to have parents who drink underage and parental attitudes are absolutely key. So parents who are relatively laissez-faire, who are very happy for children to to drink or who provide alcohol to children, um, Often, it, with the best of intentions, you know, often to think that they are trying to teach their children about moderate and responsible drinking. Um, but actually, what we do know is that um, that actually children who drink younger are much more likely to develop um, to drink more and to develop uh, underage drinking problems later on. So we do know that, that parents who are less fair and who are happy for children to drink alcohol in front of them um, are actually more likely to be storing up problems for the future. I mean, if I, if I may add something as well, actually, and Elaine is, um, is, of course, much better versed in this than myself. Um, historically, where we have tended to focus efforts um, is, is in the training side of things as well. And we have done various campaigns to um, the on-trade, the, the nighttime economy license premises, that focus on supporting them and helping to um, understand issues of people, whether... Uh, across all the age ranges, becoming vulnerable through alcohol and upskilling in terms of how to spot those and, and take appropriate action. So that is something where we have focused previously our efforts in this area. Okay, no, thank you. And I know, I mean, that the vast, vast majority of license holders are extremely responsible. Um, and I know the vast majority of parents out there are extremely responsible. Um, it was just to see if there was any correlation between mm -hmm. um, that that being, you know, being able to be in even licensed premises and um, how that might affect children. Look, I'm happy enough, and thank you. Um, and I think it just it, just to get that overview on where we are across all of the United Kingdom with alcohol. And I suppose in Northern Ireland, we um, had always been seen historically to be um, quite much worse than in other places, but in reality, we're not. Um, it's pretty much an even keel. Um, so it is. So look, I have nothing further. There's no no one else has asked, want raised a hand to ask any questions. So can I thank you both, Elaine and Adam, for for taking part today and for coming briefing the committee. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for the opportunity. Thank you both. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, members, we're going to then move on to agenda item number six, um, which is going back to the beginning, really, of our agenda. <laughs> Actually, it's item agenda number six for me. It's probably like something like two or three for you, um, which is chairperson's business. So it's as if we're starting the meeting from the very beginning now. Um, so, members, uh, just on chairperson's business, I have only one um, item that I want to bring up, and I had received correspondence um, last week. Um, from a North Belfast um, resident about uh, repairs to their home, and I just—it's so just that I'm just flagging this up. If anybody else has had any issues, and uh, it, the one the in particular repair was to do with a with a, an outside door, which we know were made here in Northern Ireland, which is great, and um, housing executive use that Northern Ireland company to supply doors, but the fixtures and fittings or door furniture are brought in from mainland UK. And uh, because of the Northern Ireland Protocol, they're unable to get they're unable to get some of the parts in order to complete repairs on Northern Ireland housing executive property. So, if members, if you're in agreement, um, would be happy enough that uh, we seek um, further information from the department just to see if this is a widespread issue um, when it comes to repairs within the housing executive. Um, has the issue around the protocol held up those um, those necessary? Equipment or parts that they may need to complete repairs. Are members in agreement with that? Yeah. Great. Can I get a yeah? Great. Good. Okay. Members, then can I move on to agenda item um, seven, which is draft minutes. Members, you'll find the draft minutes for our meeting on the 25th of February 21 at page six of your meeting pack. Are members content with the minutes as drafted? Content. Content. Thank you. Then can I move on to item eight, which is matters arising. Members, you've been provided at page 20 um, with a proposed primary legislation timetable from the department. The minister is seeking agreement of the committee members in bringing forward the legislation schedule for Annex A. Um, 
Uh, and just as I had mentioned earlier, members, when we had heard from the members of the deaf community, I don't see anywhere on that schedule or on the, within that memo uh, anything to do with the sign language um, act. Um, so I just want to. That would be one thing I would just want to highlight. Um, members, any other comments? Are they content um, for the minister to bring forward the legislation? I don't know how we're going to get through it all, but that's another. Yeah, that's for another day. Yeah. Certainly can content, Chair, but it's, it's very ambitious, I, I, I think. But, I mean, we're, we're resolved to, to get in there, but I think we have to be realistic as well in terms of how many of these pieces of legislation, even should they be introduced before Easter, as the Minister intends, he indicates that in the letter there, how many will get through the Assembly or the legislative process between now and the end of the mandate? Mark Kelly, did you want to make a comment as well? Thanks, Chair. Um, it was just on that page 23. I know that the, the welfare mitigations are proceeding, but we still haven't seen anything. This is, you know, what date is it today? The, the 4th of March. Um, we need to see a bit more coming forward. If, if we're going to help the Minister to get as much as Mark has said, it's, it's a very ambitious um proposal and uh, you know been brought to us but um if we're to get through this we need to actually be able to get the papers through um so i'd be encouraging the department to, to help the minister and get us papers as soon as possible yes, I, I agree with with that sorry janice just wants to make a comment we did write last week again on the welfare yeah. mitigations to the department janice is just reminding me that we did write again um last week to the department on the welfare mitigations and we haven't had a, a response back on that yet um, so we haven't, and members, I know uh, just, to, just to say in CLG on Tuesday it was brought up about room 21 and it, it, there, the intention is that it will be furnished in order for it to become a committee, a committee room as well. Um, so I had highlighted at that about the amount of bills that we did have. Other committees are the same, we're not just the only one. There is, an, uh, I think another committee had brought up this issue as well. Um, and any of the members who have been here for a number of years will know that towards the end of any mandate, um, quite often committees were meeting twice a week, and it was in order to get um, a lot of the, the bill work um, completed. Um, so it's just to just to put that out there as well, members. So just be prepared. Sinead, did you want to come in? Yes, sir. Um, so it's just on on that um, on page twenty one on the the betting betting gaming lotteries and amusements. Um, Bill, uh, you know, it mightn't seem the most pressing, um, you know, piece of legislation waiting to come through, but um, it's causing massive issues for clubs and organisations and societies um, who, you know, obviously their their revenue ability, revenue raising ability is down at this time and looks set to be uh, impacted further. So, you know, they'll be relying on, on these types of lotteries going forward in the time ahead. So it says they're to be confirmed awaiting executive sign off on proposals. So, and I think some of the some of the other ones as well uh, have the same comment. Um, so you know, I know the executive has a lot on its plate at the minute. But if we could just gently remind them that you know we need to get these things signed off and get them through to us, so we can we can have a look at them as soon as possible. Yeah, no, I get that absolutely. I say that on that they are on that. Um, so yeah, I know that the minister can't bring anything to us without executive sign off on these bills. So I do know that is an issue. So maybe even just writing them for an update to say, look, we need, you know, where is this at? Can you get this through to us as quick as possible? Yeah, I mean, there, it is extremely ambitious what we have been sent um, in order, and I think members are in agreement, we need to give everything full scrutiny. Um, I, I think it was also mentioned in CLG that there, I think um, there has only been one um, piece, a bill to date that has gone through this assembly that didn't require an extension. Um, in all of the years, so um, just just to make me, members mindful of that as well. Sinead was there; you remember that somebody had mentioned that as well. Um, so we have a lot of work to get through, but I do think if they are awaiting assembly sign-off, um, that's then that is just an added issue and an added problem. Um, Andy, do you want to come in? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Echo comments. You know, this is totally ambitious, and it's important that we're given the time to scrutinise it properly and efficiently. Um, just in respect to the social sector size criteria uh, legislation, I did um, table a written question a number of weeks ago, I think it was, to the minister, and 
uh, she's come, the, they've come back and advised that that legislation was shared with the executive back on the 19th, and subsequent to that, the department have received responses from each of their executive colleagues. So, um, you know, I would be keen to see that legislation, and I think the department should be in a position now that the executive has shared their feedback to share it with ourselves. Okay. All right. Well, that's one that we know of that the executive have shared. Okay. All right. Well, members, we will get back to the department then with uh, our queries and our responses, and also then that issue around the executive as well. Are members content? I move on to the next item. Yeah. Okay, members. Then can I ask you to turn to page twenty-five, um, where you'll see a response from the minister for finance on financial support for the clinically extremely vulnerable. Finance officials responded directly to the original correspondent, and a copy of this response is provided at Annex A. The Minister recognises that there are still some gaps in support for certain groups, and as a response to the correspondent, the correspondent highlights, he continues to urge his executive colleagues to bring forward proposals to use available funding, particularly for those who to date haven't, be, haven't received support, uh, support members. This was a letter we had received and we had sent on. It wasn't something we had discussed here in any great detail. Um, Kelly, you want to comment? I was going to say, just bring to everyone's attention on page 27, there's a paragraph there um, that states that the regulations are currently in place until the 5th of March. Um, that regulation is that anyone who can work from home must work from home and employers should take every possible step to facilitate their employees to do that. So. We're still, as an executive, as we heard the other day, um, you know, the, the, the restrictions are still in place, yet this advice to um, employers um, could actually drive people to not be able to work and having to resign and then ended up an unemployment benefit and joining the universal credit um, lists. I'm just wondering if we could um, ask um, the, who, the person who sent this, has that guidance now been updated um, to ensure that employers are aware while furlough is still available and while restrictions are still in place that working from home and until our phased approach um, is, is worked through by the executive that, that that guidance should stay in place. Okay, yep, agree with that. You can do that certainly. Um, any other member want to comment on this issue? No? Okay, can we move on then? Um, members, uh, you'll then find at page 28 a response from Solace with details on funding support schemes for uh, for the remaining councils, we had got some in our papers last week. Um, again, members, each of you, each member will be able to look up their own council area to see um, just exactly what they're doing, and that's what we asked for. So, are members content to note that? Yeah, content. Good stuff. Then, can I ask you to turn to page 54, where there's a departmental response on the special recognition payment to health workers? Um, the minister states that the minister for health will have to secure that the legislation relating to these payments contains social security disregards and her officials are expected to advise and assist with this. Um, bonuses are subject to income tax and national insurance regardless of whether or not an individual is claiming a benefit and that would be a matter for Treasury. The Minister has written to Theresa Kofi, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, requesting that urgent consideration is given to ensuring that the one-off payment of £500 to key workers is disregarded from Social Security benefits. So, Are members content um, with, uh, with that, content to note that at this stage? Yeah? Yes, mm -hmm. everybody? Yeah? Okay. Then can I ask you then to turn to page 56, where you'll see a departmental response on job start. Um, they have stated that officials became aware on the 11th of December 2020 that the executive's draft budget for 2021-22 included no COVID-19 allocation to address the need for labour market interventions. Um, a submission was prepared for the minister setting out the position and recommended that the scheme should be paused. The minister approved this approach on the 15th of December. I know, members, this has been another one of the issues that we have had rumbling on now. Um, for weeks on end. Can I ask members if they any comment on that response? I content to note the response. Go ahead, Kelly. I was just going to say, um, I, I can feel the Minister's frustration in this one because there was a plan, there was an approach, but it just never got the money to be able to see the light of day. Um, I just wonder if we should write to the Executive to ask what the commitment is for employment opportunities, especially for the younger people, um, given that the communities uh, is not being provided the funding to be able to do this. Okay, we can do that. 
And I suppose my frustration is as well that there's been five months of other parts of the UK where young people have had the opportunity, and I think even five months of opportunity would have been better than no months of opportunity. Um, so uh, I, I think this is another one that's going to be rumbling around for a little while until some sort of solution is found on this. So are members then uh, content with that, and we'll move on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then can we go to page fifty-seven, where you've been provided with a department rental response on the definition of a terminal illness? Um, the department has been working closely with DW with the DWP review of terminal illness provision. Um, that commenced in July 2019. DWP has set was yet to report the findings from the outcome of this evaluation, and the minister has written to the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions to urge her to give a time scale for announcing the outcome of this review. Um, and the minister will update the executive mm -hmm. and assembly colleagues as soon as is practically possible. Again, members, there's not really much more we can add to that because the minister has. Um, Done what you said you'd do, Kelly. Yes, thank you. Um, I appreciate that we're waiting on DWP, and it would be much better centrally if DWP um, brought forward their definition at long last. Um, you know, it's been going on for quite a while now. Um, I just would be quite keen. I appreciate that the minister is trying her best to get DWP to get get a move on. Nearly said something else there. Um, but if we could maybe ask the minister to clarify in her, we we know that. All ministers, all parties have said that they support this definition and that access um, for terminal illness shouldn't require this six weeks um, let or six months proof that they have it, you know, they're going to die. Um, so I'm just wondering if we could ask the, the minister just to clarify, will she consider within the welfare mitigations? We have to ask that because we haven't seen them. Um, but if there's something locally that can be done until such times that DWP actually make any movement on this because if it's not included now then those people um, will continue to die while waiting to get access to um, PIP and so on. Yeah, that's a fair enough point Kelly. I know in my speech on the budget on Tuesday on behalf of the committee um, I had raised that issue around terminal illness and um, uh, to do with the budget that we hadn't seen anything in the budget for that, and um, I raised the issue um, that if we, as Northern Ireland, want to go this alone, um, we need to see plans for that within the budget. So it was raised on behalf of the committee on Tuesday. Um, members, any other comment or content that we move on to the next piece? Yeah. Okay. Um, members, then can I ask you then to turn to page fifty-nine, um, where there's a research paper from Alcohol NI and Drugs Alliance, as asked for us following the committee. Um, briefing on the bill last week. So, members content to note that? Content. Good stuff. Okay, members, I'm going to move then on to agenda item nine, which is SR 2021 41, the Private Tenancies Coronavirus Modifications Regulations Northern Ireland 2021. Members, a copy of the statutory rule is at page 186 of your meeting pack. Can I then just ask, have members any objections to the rule? Got hands up mm -hmm. everywhere here, Robin and then Andy. Uh, sorry, Chair, no, I have no objections to the rule. Uh, in fact, I, I have two cases at the minute where the folk left the home um, at the <clears throat> request of the landlord and weren't aware that they could have stayed on. And it's for that reason, Chair, I, and if the committee would agree um, that uh, by yourself as a chair, that we actually say something publicly about this matter to make the tenants who are being impacted uh, upon by by the current situation that they have the right to stay within the properties until uh, the emergency period is declared to be over. Um, it's a sad situation when a, 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 a lady with three children um, just has to get up and go, um, only because she wasn't aware of the legislation. Or two senior citizens in private tenancy have to move in with the son um, to share the, the, the son's premises. So, and they would not have done that had they been aware of the situation. So, Chair, maybe the committee would agree via yourself that you would say something publicly. On, on this matter. Okay, thank you, Robin. Yes, Andy. 
Yeah, it was just just to echo that point that Robin's just made. I too have had uh, quite a number of cases come through my constituency office, um, whereby individuals um, weren't aware of this legislation and didn't were weren't aware they had this safeguard. Um, and maybe just to, to add to what Robin said is that we can go back to the department and ask the department if they can um, publish this more widely, you know, maybe in the, the media and, and newspapers, etc. Because it's it's certainly not getting out there onto the ground. Uh, people aren't aware they've got this um, this safety net. They're yeah. just not aware. And also, just to add to declare an interest uh, as a private sector landlord. Uh, myself and also the declaring interest in respect to the next SR, uh, so I don't interrupt her uh, as a war veteran. Okay, thank you, Andy, and I, I would agree with both of you. As I know my office has been contacted certainly as well um, over the past year um, with various issues to do with tenancies and, and private landlords, and they weren't aware either that they were within their rights to remain um, in what is their home because they've made it their home. So, yep, I absolutely agree with that. I'm sure there's something we can do with our own comms. Yes, um, to do something yeah, we can do some of our own comms to, to get um, to get that out of press yeah, release or whatever else. Mark, did you want to say yeah, something? It, it, uh, it's certainly prudent, to, I think, to, to get this out there so tenants know their rights, but also that uh, landlords know their responsibilities. I've had a couple of incidents where I, I don't think landlords were being unreasonable or anything they, they just genuinely didn't realize that this legislation existed okay no well i think it's it's to, and it's to protect everyone as well so yeah i think you're right we need to get the message out so there members and i know i just need to ask it though uh, um are there any objections to the rule so there's no objections to the rule okay then no. i'll i'll put the following that the committee for communities has considered sr 2021-41 the private tenancies, coronavirus modifications, regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. Okay, members, I'm going to move on, on then to agenda item 10, which is SR 2021-45, the COVID-19 heating payment scheme amendment regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. Members, you'll find this SR at page 194 of your meeting pack. Can I ask again if members have any objection to the rule? No objections to the rule. Then I'll put the following question that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2021-45, the COVID-19 Heating Payment Scheme Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Okay, members, thank you. We'll move on then to agenda item 11, which is correspondence. Members, the correspondence memo is page 203 of your meeting pack. I just want to draw your attention to uh, a few items, starting at page 205. And this is a memo in relation to PAC Primacy over Northern Ireland Audit Office reports. Um, Kelly, you had asked for this to be brought back for further consideration. Um, is there any further action that you wish the committee to take? I'm just wondering about, there's a few of those, um, they're marked in amber, um, for instance, governance issues in sport NI, welfare reforms in NI, that um, PIC are keeping hold of. Uh, I'm just sort of wondering um, how long they will have that and when we will be able to get sight of those, because the longer they have those, then the less we will see them in time you know, for considerations on welfare reform, especially whenever mitigations and so on are coming forward. Um, I'm just, I know that they get the, they get to review them first, but um, it does have an impact on our work and we need to see some of those reports. Just want to make sure that we will have access to them before um, too long. Okay, well, we can certainly ask the question. We can go back and ask that. But, um, members, any other comment on that member or that part of correspondence? No? Okay. Um, then, members, can I ask you then to turn to pages? Uh, it, it's actually three requests to brief the committee. They're at 209, 219, and 232. Um, and I just would propose at this stage um, that our focus on the deliberations of the licensing bill. Um, that we ask for, um, because of that, we ask for written briefings in the first instance um, from all three of those uh, the, the, those uh, organisations that wanted to, or um, people that wanted to brief us. If members agreed with that, 
Not many yeah. we won't come back to them because I know certainly um, a, a, the one with, from um, Chartered Institute of Housing. I mean that will be something that we want to look at when we are looking at the program for government and the housing element within the program for government. So we will we will hear from from these groups, but it's just at the minute um, uh, would, uh, a written briefing would suffice at the moment. Members agreed then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chair, if I, Chair, if I could just come on there, I, I agree um, uh, with yourself. Uh, I think it would be very important to hear from the National Insulation Association. So um, if it is something that we can factor in very soon, because there is a major issue there. It affects thousands of homes across the north. Um, so I would be keen that they would also come on and present to the committee. I mean, I'm 100% with you on that. I, I certainly represent an area with large um, Northern Ireland housing uh, uh, executive housing estates, especially Rathkill, and you know some of the conditions that people are living in, um, and the housing executive like to blame it on people drying clothes over a radiator, which is not what it is. It's 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 poor insulation. It's damp. It's dreadful conditions. Um, so I, I'm 100% with you there, Karen. Um, as soon as we can get them in. Um, when we finish this bill, we will we'll certainly Thank you, will. Chair, just exactly like yourself. Um, you know, every it just keeps going on the all our winter where families are suffering. Um, and when we look at fuel poverty and energy efficiency and all of that. So thank you, Chair. Yep. Thank you, Karen, for, for highlighting that. Okay, members, anything else they want to highlight under correspondence memo that I haven't already? No? Okay. Then can we move on then to agenda item 12, which is our forward work programme. Members, um, the meeting on the 11th of March 2021, the committee will, sorry, I'm, uh, next week, that's next week, yeah. The committee will begin its deliberations on the licensing and reg registration of clubs amendment bill. Um, so that's our forward work programme for next week. Any comments on that? Content? And I don't even know what week we're on here at the moment. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, members, then, can I move you then on to agenda item 13, which is AOB? I know, Kelly, you had sent through something yesterday that you wanted to bring up. Yes, please, Chair, if I could. Um, I'd shared it around with everyone, but I'm glad to have the opportunity to bring it up here. It's just to ask if the committee could write to museums uh, northern. National Museums Northern Ireland for clarification on the support that they have offered to that railway society that we had been had evidence from that railway society. Um, there's an agreement now that they will move off the site. They've been given an extra three months to do so. Um, but I think just from this committee's point of view and our interest in it, I would like to know from NMNI, um, they have offered help to move MESNI off the site. What does that help involve? Is that to cover all the costs of moving the items, including the railway track and the workshop and the associated costs, for instance, if that is um, a crane? And then the next one would be to write to the minister. Um, MESNI, as we know, when we met them, are largely a voluntary organisation. Um, that While they did ask for donations on site, while they were housed within the Osterfolk and Transport Museum, they had no opportunities to generate income. So the cost of them um, to move and to set up at their new venue, which I believe will be Drum Away, um, just means that it's, it's extraordinarily expensive and it's not a, a an item that we want to lose in Northern Ireland. So I would just like to ask the Minister if there's an opportunity for support for that group, funding support for that group, to help them with their move um, now that NMNI have stopped their lease and um, they have to move off the site. Uh, they are a community and voluntary organisation. I think they're valuable to Northern Ireland, but then I am a geek on transport. But I would just like the Minister, now I have, I've, when I spoke to the group, I said to them that they would need to be very clear that they would need to put, you know, their back into providing some of that, and if if the national museums are going to help move, you know, physically move items, um, what sort of costs they'd be looking at? So I just would be keen for the minister to engage with them. Okay, no, Kelly, I think you're absolutely right, um, and I know I remember that briefing, whether it was from the museums or the department that had said and made a commitment um, for assistance with the moving. Um, so they did say it. It's just they didn't. They didn't go into any detail of what level. So I think you're right. We need to ask those questions. So thank you. Members in agreement with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other business members want to bring up? No. 
Good stuff. And just to just uh, one chair, it might be a wee bit early, but members will have seen some news coverage earlier in the week. It's around a potential bid uh, from the UK and Ireland to host the World Cup, the Soccer World Cup in 2030. Uh, I was just wondering maybe if we could write to the department and ask what consideration has been given to the use of, of stadia facilities here in the north. And I think it underlines the importance to sort of proceed with the sub-regional stadia piece, as well as indeed the, the, the regional one. I, I, I'm not, uh, I suppose, naive enough to think that there's going to be many <laughs> matches played here in the north, but if we do have... Uh, stadia capable of hosting matches, group matches, and even some uh, knockout stages. That will be great. So that's the, the, the casement piece. But the sub-regional one, there'll be opportunities there, I think, for clubs, for cities to host teams. Teams will be looking for training camps and places. And, you know, the, the, the economic potential of such a, of such a you know, event coming to these islands would be massive and it's important that we maximise that potential for the north. No, Mark, thank you. I did. I saw that on the news and I remember um, sitting on the DSD committee at the time whenever we were looking at the rugby um, coming over, to, uh, over to, across all Ireland and how exciting it all seemed and you know the, the, a lot of and how it was doable. Um, so, and, yeah. Know, I know there might be issues around sporting codes or whatever, but, but, this, but there might be opportunities there to get funding as well to, towards some some of the aims of the department no i think we we certainly want to be in at the beginning of this as well and if there's anything we can do to help um it, for this to be achieved and it, it can be achieved um then yep yeah, committee support it members great good Great's stuff chair. Oh, go ahead Sinead. Yeah, just on that, and Mark might know this already, but just for members' information, um, FIFA rules say that uh, the stadium for these competitions must be able to hold 40,000. So, you know, obviously we don't currently have a stadium in the north that would be able to host one of these games should the bid be successful. So, um, obviously that will, will, you know, it's inconceivable that a tournament would come to these islands and that a game wouldn't be hosted in, in Belfast. So, um, I think that just... Uh, you know, makes it all the more important that we we have a stadium that's able to uh, have that capacity, and then we we open up the potential for us to host a game and all the economic and, and sporting benefits that go with it that that Mark has outlined there. No, thank you for that, Sinead. Um I I know when it was the, when we were looking at it um, back a few many years ago, it seems now with the rugby, it was looking at Mark said as as having times that host. You know, because there will be lots of practice required. Um, um, throughout that as well, so there, there's there's opportunities across the board, um, but we need to maximise on those opportunities as well. Of course, understand that. Okay, members, are they, are you happy that I move on from AOB? Yes. Okay, um, members. Then I'm going to move to agenda item 14, which is date, time, and location of our next meeting. Our next meeting will take place in room 29. Um, next week, Thursday, the 11th of March at 9:15 a.m. Can I just remind members that we are going into a, cl a short closed session now? So please stay on the line um, um, whenever I am going to turn the cameras off now. Okay, so thank you. This is.